It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Andy, Renee, and Alex are all here. The whole team is in. We're going to talk, of course, about Apple's stunning quarter. Quarterly results are in. And some things that Tim Cook said that I thought were kind of interesting. We will talk about something Tim Cook did not say <laughs> to Elon Musk. And some rumors, new Macs to come, all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 777, recorded Tuesday, August 3rd, 2021. Husks are a part of life. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Modern Finance. The financial landscape is harder than ever to navigate, but you don't have to do it alone. Download and subscribe to Kevin Rose's Modern Finance podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts, and get ahead of the future of finance. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the latest news from Apple. And the news boys are here. Mr. Renee Ritchie from YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Hello, Renee. Hello, Leo. It's Hello. so good to be back with you and everybody today. Yes. Nice to have you back. Andy Anako, WGBH Boston. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. And, of course, Alex Lindsay. Office hours in 090.mediaofficehours.global. If you want to know more about the 24-7 festival that office hours is all so about, much fun all about media production yep. uh you know it's funny because yesterday google did a very unappley thing and i thought it'd be interesting mm. to see if maybe we could encourage <laughs> apple to do the same thing they invited a hand-picked crew of uh journalists in which is not actually is very appley but they rick osterlo <laughs> who runs google's hardware division uh invited them in to take a look at to play with and to talk about the next Google Pixel phone, which won't be out till October. Yeah. Uh, so Google, there's no keynote. They just brought some folks in to show it to them. And they didn't show, you know, they but said they you can't take pictures. They like to leak their you, stuff now. Yeah. So basically, I think it's a, it's kind of, it is preemptory leaking, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. preemptive leaking. But I also think. Well, pr I, well, Prosser leaked it. So I think they just did this, like, like last year, they did this in response. They did it last year as well. They could control the story. But I also yeah. think, and maybe it is something to be take. Look, everybody knows, you know, that the new iPhone will be, the, you know. A certain step up in processor mm -hmm. power, bigger, slightly bigger screen. You know, we kind of know the outlines of it, not from rumors, just because that's what they do every year. Maybe it wouldn't be a, a bad idea for Apple a couple of months early to bring in some people and say, here's some things we're looking at for the next generation of iPhone and some reasons you might want to pay attention when we do finally announce it. That's essentially what Google did. Yeah. And, and they got a lot of free publicity. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, it was pretty much puffy. You can't. You, there's yeah. nothing to double down on because you can't test it. You can't try it. Well, he, they didn't really like, say like, the, like uh, the Wired article was really good. Like it was really in depth. But Rick Ostrello managed to say nothing. Like yeah. it was an entire article about the custom silicon that was coming to Google with zero information. It's in going it. to be better. I'm wary of Rick. Yeah. Well, I'm <laughs> wary of Rick Ostrello because many, many times he has said things like, "This is a completely Google designed phone," and it turns out HTC did most of the industrial design for it. Right. Or he said well, like the new Pixel's coming, and it turns out the battery's terrible. So when he says it's a completely Google designed, I, I would love that. I would love more custom silicon, but. It may turn out that this is a Samsung designed processor with a Google uh, Tensor Core like uh, neural engine attached to it, and we d we just don't know yet. All we see is like massive articles Actually, with no information. I think it's very likely that's exactly what it is. Well, I, 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 I'm I, pretty sure I, that's not what he said. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you, but you can also say that, well, no, this isn't Apple designed silicone because they, they licensed this technology from ARM. They licensed they don't, it. They don't, though. They, they licensed 0% of it from ARM now. Oh, I'm, it's but, completely I'm sorry, Apple you, custom. Uh, but but again, the the foundation is ARM. The, they they have they have people working on the team that they hired or bought or acquired. I but I, I, I do agree with you. This is this was an interest. I, I agree with Leo too that I think that this is the more adult way of going through this. Instead of saying, I I, I, I roll my eyes a little bit when Apple says, oh, I bet we would like to have like the the theater, the, the 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 theatrical, the surprise. Like okay, no, this this we aren't children. This isn't Christmas. We are people who have an old <laughs> phone. We have we have a thousand dollars that we have budgeted to buy a new one. We are going to see a really cool phone introduced by Samsung in August. We might see another one. Uh, we, we know that another cool phone is going to be introduced by another company in October. We're trying to make a decision on where our attention should be. 
Um, do you think it's a better it, strategy to kind of, uh, as Google did, pre-announce and get people kind of excited? I mean, obviously, that excitement's not going to last through October, but just kind yeah, of right, raise the buzz about it care. and then announce it with more concrete stuff in October. Or is it better to do what Apple did does, which is say absolutely <laughs> nothing? It's safer because they're not selling a lot of phones, and Apple is. Apple would kill iPhone 12 sales if they did this almost immediately. And Google, I don't think they care that ah. much. Ah, so there's price. the risk, is Osborning, as they used to call it, Osborning yeah. your existing products, but uh, pre-announcing new products when your existing products are still for sale. And also... You don't control them. You know, you don't have nearly the same control over the narrative. You know, if you do it this way, so it's it is a I mean, from a corporate perspective. I think Google had to do it in some ways because they're not ready to release the phone or show the phone. It feels like Apple has less control of the narrative because any you can speculate anything at this point, right? Well, and we do. They have less control now, but when they release the film, when they release a phone or they release a product and they choose to do a keynote, they are playing to the press, but they're also heavily playing towards the public. You know, they're having. You know, there are tens of millions of people that are going to get Apple's version of, of exactly what this what this is about, and they're able to weave a uh, a storyline around what they're you know what that means you know and why it's important and why these products and that can get lost you know a lot of the you know some press are going to catch up on it but um you know like someone who is really understands it is going to understand oh this is why this is important and this is what what's there um but but apple uh wants to make sure that you're clear that you know they just spent you know, a billion dollars on some on some feature it'd be really good if you make sure you understand why it's important and and so um, and so a lot of times press may jump over some of those things. You'll have a, a Renee Richer, a Renee, a Renee Richer, <laughs> a Renee Richie or a Andy Anako or, uh, or, you know, other folks that really understand the technology, really understand what it is, but you have a lot of press that won't. And I think that Apple wants to make sure that, I mean, I, I don't know, but I think that, that making sure that they, they tell the story the way they want to tell it and then let the press chew it up and talk about it however they want, but they have their version of it out there. I think that Well, that's Google, why the pre-announcement is to kind of uh, whet people's appetite and start the steering. Because right now, Apple has zero control over what people are saying about their new phone and all sorts of cuckoo stuff might come out. We saw, but yeah, I, I think, and they can do anything with the, like the demos that they're showing, they weren't allowed to, to video it separately. They weren't allowed to shoot any photos. Oh yeah, it's useless Google information. could show them that their video was better. But they did a demo yeah. where they showed that their video is better than an iPhone and they're, they're, they're all ha caveating Saying, we just saw this and we think it looks way better. We can't prove it. Exactly. To you yet. Google's, so it's, it's Google's like playing a little game. I think you have a point, Renee, which is interesting. In fact, Apple has pre announced products where there is no predecessor product whose market you would kill. Yeah. Um, but I also think. Or they don't that, care like the Mac Pro. Or they don't care. But I also. <laughs> so Apple has done this a little bit in the past. Yeah. I think that was kind of a big change when they did that uh, with the Mac Pro. But the other thing is that Google, maybe the. Maybe the the chilling effect is not on Google's current phone, but on other companies. Maybe if Google can give make a, a, a case that you shouldn't be looking at a Samsung next generation Samsung phone because wait till you see well, what Huawei, we've got. Yeah. So maybe it's also a little defensive move. Well, Apple doesn't also, have to I worry think, about that. I, I, I think, think Google Samsung has sales a, are way down, like they're half what they were last year already, which is not good for them. But I think that also Google has an issue where um, you if you go, if you put out a product in August. Um, over the summer, both in the United States and Europe, your impact is much less. Oh, like yeah. I understand why Google's and, waiting until after the iPhone comes no, no. out to announce their phone. They always do that. Well, they're, they're waiting because Apple comes right out of the gate um, that first week and you're in their wake for the next 90 days. Exactly. So the thing is, is that yeah. you're, so the thing, you know, or at least the next 30 Should they announce days. right before Apple's announcement? Would that so, be better? Well, I no, the problem so. is you're, that's Labor Day weekend. Yeah. <laughs> like, like literally, Apple a, comes out. Apple of it has has really routinely staked, it's usually the month after, put a right? put a right. flag in the ground for where the best possible place to announce the yeah, phone is. It is, and they it own is it. literally for for the Christmas season. Yeah, they the own week it. that Apple does the, the 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 week of September 10th plus or minus is the best week in the year to release a product. And Apple has made it clear that if you if you release a product there, no one's going to hear you because because it's because everyone is talking about their product and they built that up over time. But but I think that they that is literally the best week in of, for the if you're doing a consumer product, it's the best week of the year is the week after the Labor Day week, um, going into the Christmas. That is the perfect week to release a product, except for the Samsung fact that you can't release anything so near it Apple. Might, it might be earlier this year, but Samsung, I think Samsung has Samsung a foldable August, event this week. Um, 
next it's week. Not as, next not week. as effective. So but they can do it. It's but it's also for foldables, which aren't really, which are really a, a class of their own. You know, if you're in that market. But it's there's, usually the note. Like it's usually the note slot. The foldables. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be a note. That's why. Yeah. The but weird thing you're to right. me August is like, is the note. I like. I buy a Pixel every year. I bought the Nexus every year, and I buy a Pixel every year. And just the one thing that gets me is that every year, it's still a repudiation of the year that came before. Like the Pixel 5 <laughs> is, is nothing like the Pixel it? 4, is nothing like, and the things that they said that they deliberately did to not be a certain way, they do exactly that for the next one. Like, we don't need this, we're doing this, this is mandatory. No, it turns out we didn't need that. We're going high end, we're going that's, low end. That's you don't need so a Pixel Google. Core. That's just so Google. We don't so need Google. a Pixel Core. Oh, now we're doing our full <laughs> silicon. We you don't know, need a second if, camera. Yeah, we yeah. don't need. They don't they, have a coherent the strategy if, on anything. But for, um, like, I, if, I really like the Pixel. Like, if there was any phone I couldn't get beside it, like if I could never get an iPhone, I would get a Pixel phone. Yes. But it would behoove me as a customer if they stuck with a platform for several years so they could really mature it rather than redoing everything from scratch every year just because their CFO is still fighting with their product lead, is still fighting with their feature, their engineering lead. Just, I, I want one Pixel for four they, years. They, I just they wish, did, ex I, I they just, did exactly that. The Pixel right. One led naturally into Pixel Two, which led naturally into Pixel Three. The Pixel Four was an aberration, mostly because of Soli, which was a very, a very, a very googly thing to do. Which was a very extremely exciting technology that they decided they're going to sort of leave behind and not do things about. But you have to realize that between the three, the uh, uh, that, that there's an inflection point around the uh, point of the three and four. This is when they acquired the mobile division of HTC. Uh, and so essentially they're integrating this whole team. The Pixel 4 was, I, I think, a very, very uh, awkward marriage of teams. There's of that very, very famous and very, very baffling like all hands meeting that Osterlo had a month before oh. the Pixel 4 yes. was coming oh. out to say that we I don't understand this product at all. We made so many of these mistakes. This is why I was one. Uh, yeah, Good I was marketing, sort of Rick. Good Good job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, 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 that's the press doing their job. Uh, but the, the this is why the Pixel 6, I think, has been, I've been anticipating it for a couple of years. Like, here's the, what's going to be the first phone that comes out that is naturally and integrally a unified mm -hmm. Google product with all these teams. Yes. Again, there are all kinds of, uh, all kinds of acquisitions coming in at all times. Uh, I think that the addition, uh, and I think that the, this strategy of not, not only having these half dozen people come in for a little extremely, extremely restricted hands-on, but also they put it up a blog post. They also put up other things for the public to see. Um, I, but this was a very, so I think this was a very, very important thing for them to do this time because it's one thing to say, hey, it's a, we have, our, we added something cool to our old phone. It's this radar sensor that will do things like gestures. Okay, that's fine. But here they're, they're talking about a lot of things, a lot of fundamental technologies that make this point by point by point a much, much more of a, more of a high-end, uh, uh, high-tier phone experience, which is not something that you've really associated with the Pixels. The the process that they're putting they're putting together themselves, uh, being able to integrate all of that with the battery life, uh, being able to integrate that. It, be, uh, Apple's biggest <laughs> Apple's Apple's thermal exhaust port <laughs> to, torpedo down the ex thermal exhaust port has been what if. Google is able to do all of their AI, which is amongst the best in the world, but figure out a way to do it almost entirely on device so that there aren't any privacy concerns, except for the fact that there's a Google label on this phone. So there's a lot of stuff they had to break. I thought it was a good idea. If, if they're having their event in October, as usual, that's enough time for that seed to be put in people's heads. Uh, and remember, there's a lot. There's, it's a much bigger problem of getting uh, of. Uh, Android users switching to iPhone. There are a lot more people doing that than from the other way around. So it's important for them to get the word out that look, if you've been, if you've been, if you have a phone that's two or three or four years old and you're itching for something new, here's why you should at least wait to see what we've got coming because it's possible that the things that have frustrated you, I have to say they frustrated me too about the Pixel experience. You might find that we'll be, what we've got coming in October will solve those problems. And you know what? Apple's going to be making plenty of iPhones. There will still be plenty in stock if you decide to wait a month. So that, I think it was a very smart thing for them to do. I mean, I think they have to think outside the box because the market share is starting to slide, you know, and so I think that they have to, you know, think about how they're going to get the, get the word out there. I mean, the, the craziest thing is, is you look at things like AR, like uh, LiDAR. I mean, everything I got excited about and everything I learned about AR related to a phone was on, with, was using Tango. You know, doing R and D, yep. you know, with phones that we had uh, to order uh, directly technology. from China. Yeah, this is right. Google technology, circa 2014, 2015, 2016. We were doing R and D you know, heavy R&D with those phones. And we had to direct ship them from China to be able to use them. And um, the fact that they let it go and, and 
we can see the difference between the two companies in a lot of ways when we look at that because they just put something out there like we're just going to throw it against the wall and then they it didn't go anywhere and what we're watching is apple just rolling a very slow giant boulder down that path of just slowly incorporating it in and that's the difference i think that's it, it shows the difference between how the two companies approach product development so okay so that's the question. It really isn't about the new phone. We're going to talk a lot about that tonight and all about Android. That'll be obviously the biggest topic of discussion tonight. But uh, I just thought it'd be interesting to talk about Apple's strategy and, and why they don't do something like this. I still think I'd like them to do a little preview. I think they'll do it with any product that's not selling well. Like the iPhone is their best selling product. They won't <laughs> they don't want it. It doesn't matter. Like the Mac yeah. Pro, like the time by the time the 2019 Mac Pro came out, very few people were buying that Nobody trash could. can. So they yeah. just Osborne all over it. Yeah. Speaking of the Mac Pro, they have actually done an upgrade for the uh, Intel Mac Pro. They've added some new graphics capabilities. Yeah. The Intel part wasn't ready, so they went with the AMD parts. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, is this a signal that the Intel Mac Pro has has still has years to go? Uh, is it to it's reassure people? They did a people? final update. Yeah, they did a final update on every Intel box for the people who just wanted the Intel version to tie them over. Like especially people like Alex who aren't going to trust brand new software on their studio ninety person seat thing, and they want to buy one that's going to last three four years until all the the worn edges or take the rough edges are taken off. Apple well, Silicon. I, I have to. And this was supposed to happen earlier. It was supposed to happen with with new Xeon processors, but those processors weren't any faster. And now the new the new new Xeon processors weren't ready yet. So now and they delayed. I believe they delayed the big Navi rollout because these are RDNA two graphics cards. And then they finally, I think, shipped it without Intel, which to me is like the cherry on top of the why we're doing this transitioning Sunday. These are not inexpensive upgrades, incidentally. <laughs> if you uh, <laughs> if you're in the market, the least expensive, the Radeon Pro W sixty eight hundred X. With 32 gigs of GDDR6 GDDR6 memory is 2,400 bucks, but uh, some of the other. I mean, this is could be this is kind of a the fatal flaw of the Mac Pro is that they're not using Nvidia because most of no us kidding. that are doing graphics aren't really yeah. we don't really consider these valid cards, and so the, so the fact that you're putting in five thousand dollar cards that we don't want, you know, is is kind of hard. I mean, I think for researchers who are doing slightly different um, you know um, calculations that may the fragmenting may may be fine for them. The, the way that the AMD cards approach graphics is not conducive to most of what we do. So for graphics folks, the, these cards, you know, why am I going to spend $5,000 on that? I'm just going to buy a PC. They talk so, about... Like, literally, this is where we start moving. Like, I have a PC so that I can use NVIDIA cards. They talk about 23% uh, faster performance in DaVinci Resolve and 84% faster in Octane X. Are those programs that would be even faster with NVIDIA? Uh, it's not so much those might be a little bit. I mean, I, I don't know. Those aren't. That's fine. Um, the but but the Nvidia stuff is when we're actually working. And that's what matters. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you know, it's, so it's a niche you know, market that they're well, aiming at. What is the deal? Uh, they're the not. Is, by the way, this is not necessarily going to be solved with an M1 or whatever, an Apple Silicon based. Intel I mean, we're doing or, we're doing a lot of Resolve work in you know in the M1 right now, and you can and you can have a Mac, you can have a Mac Pro do a lot of those things, but the Mac Pro is not a server. Like rendering time is less important because it's not a server based. It's not a computer you get and you put it into a into a you put a hundred or a thousand or two thousand of them in there and let them process. This is a an artist is actually using it. So what matters is is not the rendering time. It is what is the artist doing and how responsive is it when the artist on the person that I'm paying a hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollars an hour. You know when someone sits down at a resolve station, I'm I'm paying them three hundred twenty five dollars an hour. Like that's the that's the number, right? So. I want whatever they're doing to work really well and fast. <laughs> so, 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 and, and yes. fast. And, and so, and so what I care about is not the render time. What I care about, because they can walk away and have lunch and hopefully not charge me for it. What I care about <laughs> is when they're rendering. No, I don't know, Alex, play. I'm rendering. Uh, I think yeah, that's exactly. work. <laughs> but, but it's, but it's, it's, uh, it's when it's playing. And when I open up a 60 million polygon uh, project in Maya, or I open up a, you know, something else, or, or I'm I'm, rent, I'm building something in Cinema 4D, and I and I and I have lighting effects, and I have all this stuff, and I need to look at a preview, or if I do, those are the things that matter to me. Is is what is what does a heavy model in Cinema 4D uh, do it affects me? How long it takes for Cinema 4D to create the frames for me overnight. I don't really care. Um, yeah. And so, so the thing is, is that it's so that the, they, they keep on going back to rendering times, what they're not talking about is responsive times. And that's what we, you know, and, and it's harder, it's harder to calculate too. I mean, and, and the Cinebench is, 
you know, good at some of those things as far, you know, I'd rather see Cinebench um, stuff than, than necessarily uh, uh, rendering times. But that's, yeah. of course, they're using rendering times because I'm sure the numbers were better. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, but it's not that the, the like the 6900... XT is a terrible GPU. No, it's not terrible. It's just that it's just that if you're going to spend that kind of money, it, for folks who are spending that kind of money, they're going to spend that kind of NVIDIA GPU is pretty good. You is know, it, and it faster in, or just easier to work with? Well, from a developer's perspective, at least when we've developed stuff for it, it's much the NVIDIA is much easier to, to work with. It's so easier. it's easier to develop for. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so as a result, a lot of developers prefer to go down that path and so there's more support for it and deeper support and so so the um so the nvidia tends to have uh, you know just in general uh, more support except for everywhere except for the mac and, and so um but on the pc side and, uh, and what's crazy is that uh, you want the amd threadripper as the cpu but then you end up getting the nvidia as the right. uh, as the gpu right yeah, and Apple and NVIDIA don't play well together because they both yeah. are powerful enough to want their way. Like, yeah. Apple wants everything to be an endpoint for metal. They just want to write straight to the hardware. They don't want any of your custom stuff on top of it. And NVIDIA, they just basically want cards to be commodities. And NVIDIA wants the computers to be commodities and everybody to write to CUDA cores. <laughs> and because they're both successful, they have no desire to to meet in the middle. Uh, and they don't like each other on top of it. So it's just the worst forever. So you said something interesting. So you... Uh, they were supposed to put Ice Lake in. Do you think this means that they're not going to do any more Intel, any Xeon in upgrades for the Mac Pro? I think, yeah, because it sounds like the Mac, the the Apple Silicon Mac Pro is not going to come until late next year. So if late Intel's next year, really going to be shipped. Yeah, well, that's Mark Gurman's last last newsletter said late uh, 2020. Uh -huh. He's starting his stopwatch at November of last year when they announced it. I started mine at, at WWDC 2020, uh, uh, 2020 when they when they said they're doing Apple Silicon. So we're on different clocks. But a year for me would be Janu would be June, and a year for him is November. So he's he's thinking November. Yeah, Apple um, said the transition would, the would take two. Update. Apple said the transition yeah. would take two years. So he's saying two years from November, basically. Yeah, and they've been a hard two years, like with a lot of the components and a lot of the things that they've wanted to do. Um, chip it, shortage. Taking longer than I don't. Yeah. I'd be well, blown away if Apple releases shortage, another. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I think the I think they'll get the Ice Lake. They'll get the Ice Lake out early next year. Uh, mm -hmm. If Intel, because that's, it seems like Intel is going to take forever to get out the part Apple needs. But it's I think like early next year if they do an Ice Lake bump. And notice, in th this was not announced by Apple. Apple said nothing about this. AMD announced this. <laughs> AMD put up a web page about this. You cannot mm -hmm. find that very much information on Apple. It is a completely AMD led press initiative on this. So I wouldn't. I don't think Intel is going to do any press for Apple anytime soon. But I wouldn't be surprised if Apple if the Apple Store just quietly included the latest Ice. Lake Xeons at some point. I just and and, uh, and Alex, you disagree. You think they're not going to put any more energy into this? Oh, they, they might put another chip in. I mean, they, they might upgrade the chip, but they're not going to do any major major updates. I think that, um, and I think Apple is also, also the reason they're not going to spend a lot of time talking about AMD is that they are they're looking at a future that doesn't use any of anybody else's genes. Anybody's, yeah. You know? So, yeah. so I don't think that they. Why would you spend a lot of any any energy on talking about GPUs when in in eighteen months you're never going to talk about anybody's GPU again? It's the dream. They're living the dream. Let's take a little break. We did get uh, quarterly results from Apple. I have all of Jason Snell's color graphs. And we'll, and we'll, and we'll work our way all through those. All six colors? <laughs> all six colors. We'll work our way through uh, those in just a little bit. I guess in a way I buried the lead, although I think quarterly results aren't exactly news that newsworthy, but maybe we can... Lots of people far wealthier than you are going to have a very good Christmas back <laughs> after this. Yeah, exactly. In a nutshell, that's it. Uh, but I guess there might be some nuggets uh, we can glean from it about Apple's future and so forth, so we'll do that in just a little bit. Renee Ritchie, Andy Anako, Alex Lindsay, the Mac Break Weekly team is in the house. Our show today brought to you by, and I really want to thank Kevin Rose for this, he is so great. Uh, Kevin, as you know, the dark tipper from the screensavers way back when. He's been a longtime uh, partner uh, of mine and worked on um, early Twitch shows with us and so forth. And actually, he's on Twitch whenever we can get him. Has a new podcast of his own. And I really want to give him a big plug because I've listened to it and it's great. It's called Modern Finance, or as the kids call it, MoFi. MoFi. Uh, and I can't think of a better person to help you navigate this, the crazy world in finance around us than, than Kevin Rose. But, you know, I mean, he is an expert in all of this, Bitcoin, NFTs, uh, you know, the new robo-investors. Everybody's talking about it, 
But how do you know what it means and whether it's something you need to pay attention to? And it's a great listen. Modern finance helps to demystify crypto, decentralized finance. Kevin is, a, I don't need to sell Kevin, He's, but I will. He's a top 25 angel investor, according to Bloomberg. One of the top 25 most influential people on the web in Time Magazine. But he's also a brilliant guy. He's This has become his area of expertise. He's fascinated by it. And he's done a great job of demystifying it with modern finance. It's a show, crypto show for the novice and expert alike. They don't dumb it down. You know that's Kevin. Uh, he's a partner at True Ventures, so he really has a lot of insight into what's going on in finance. Then he brings in top tech experts and entrepreneurs, talks about modern finance tools, helping others understand cryptos, NFTs, even traditional finance hacks. I didn't understand NFTs at all until I listened to his, actually it was his debut issue uh, episode of Modern Finance, Modern Finance One. And I was, so I was like, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. They do two shows on one feed. Once a week, they do a consensus episode that explores weekly news and distills it into digestible information. And then the second show of the week has deeper interviews with the people like individual crypto founders and NFT artists. Uh, <laughs> look, it's not just that you need to, next time you go to a cocktail party, be able to say what an NFT is. It's really, I think, important to understand this landscape and what opportunities it presents to you in terms of your investments. You want to stay informed, and there's no easier, more enjoyable way to do that than modern finance. I've listened to MoFi since day one. Kevin Rose, he's great. Um, I think he's the guy to talk about this, to be your guide in this, and I think the modern fight, I'm so glad he's doing this. I'm really happy to give him a big, fat plug. The financial landscape is Harder than ever to navigate, but you don't have to do it alone. Download and subscribe to Modern Finance, wherever you listen to podcasts. Modern Finance, wherever you listen to podcasts. Don't be the last person on the next train out. <laughs> listen to Modern Finance and get ahead on the future of finance. MoFi.net is the uh, web page. The short version of the webpage, which leads to Modern Diet Finance. A really great podcast. It's everywhere you can uh, get your podcast. Good on you, Kevin. He keeps creating great content. I don't know how he has time. He's, I'm sure, pretty busy with uh, True Ventures, but uh, he does a great job. And we'll have Kevin on one of our shows very soon to talk about this. MoFi, Modern Finance. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. All right, time for the color charts. <laughs> Thanks. Every time I uh, tell Jason, thank you for doing this, he says, "Well, it's really just a script. It doesn't." <laughs> well, I think that I think that I think that he needs to expand through everything. Like I would yeah. love to have yeah. his graphs about like every day. He should just put out something. It doesn't have to be about Apple. It could be about anything. Like I just love his charts are just amazing, and I get so much out of looking at them all. Yeah, you know, like a, like a, oh, well, that's I really the thing. Understand I understand the data. I think you can look at the numbers, and at least for me, it doesn't speak to me nearly as much as like for instance this pie chart, which is Apple's quarterly revenue by category, immediately stands out that the iPhone is no longer the completely dominant revenue right. driver. That it's only forty nine percent, and what's that big purple wedge on the left? Services now tw driving twenty one percent of quarterly revenue, not profit necessarily, but I think that tells you a lot about how Apple has changed in the last few years. Yeah, you can make a lot of money off of just pushing electrons. Uh, and I think yeah. and if there's one thing that's going to help them out, if and when the world changes again and people are sick and tired of carrying phones in their pocket, they got the next thing on the runway ready to go, in addition to the yeah. stuff they haven't announced yet. Yeah, 36% year-over-year revenue change. It's, I think, again, another record quarter. Uh, for uh, in in the in the third quarter for Apple, I don't see a bigger Q3 anywhere. Of course, Q3 is not traditionally its biggest quarter. Q1 is that's when the new iPhones come out. So you'll see those peaks in revenue, good and in profit too. Good profit uh, quarter, twenty one billion dollars in three months, seven billion dollars a month. I mean, not you a know, bad we, business. yeah, it's not a not a bad business to be in. <laughs> uh, revenue is up, as I said, thirty six percent. I thought the revenue was interesting that, that if you take the, if you kind of draw a line across what you had just before this, um, if you draw a line up that and you just kind of extend that line on that initial cliff or the initial little hill, it just would, it would almost meet the ones that are on the far end. And it was like, we were 
we had it figured out, and then we had a rough patch, and then we're back to where we were. <laughs> yeah, the rough <laughs> so the, patch is yeah. uh, is from 19, 2019 through uh, 2021. Uh, uh, there was a very steady growth in 2017, 2018, right. then up to 2019, and then it just tanked. What happened? This is this, by the way, is a is a uh, is a vector. This is a del it's year over year revenue growth. So it's kind of a it's not exactly a direct match to revenue and totally or profit even, but the year over year revenue change was down. It was actually negative in a few of those years. Yeah, they had a huge well, China the, problem for a quarter. What was it? There was a huge China problem. For China, the one that Tim Cook put the letter out about. That's that they right. Said they weren't going to meet. So that's yeah. that's pre and then something happened in China in 2021. Is that is that kind of because yeah the growth is really nice. They had a, yeah, they had a bunch of bad factors hit them all at once for I think a couple a couple after big quarter like after holiday quarters uh, for two years. But like Alex said, they those were anomalies. It turned out those weren't directions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Good good news with services. 21 percent of overall revenue, but really also and as a Mac guy, I'm happy to see this. Good news in the Mac. Yeah. Great Mac revenue. Yeah. M1. Uh, M1, baby. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of a lot of restored faith in the in the Mac end of things. It, for, yeah. A couple of years ago, you could have if 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 an analyst had said that they're worried that Apple if they see signs that Apple is going to be uh, ramping down the Mac in favor of either a new platform or a new iOS or a new focus on other things, it would have been an outlier, but you would have had people saying that kind of makes sense. I'm not going to dismiss that out of hand, but now the Mac seems to have a very very bright and glorious feature. This well, is I think that also they they're right. slowly figuring a couple of things out because they, you know, I don't think that Apple really was making the best computer they could from 2016 until about 2020. I mean, they had key, they had bad keyboards. They took away our MagSafe. <laughs> they did a bunch of things that made a bunch of us not buy Macs. Like I was like Desi holding on to my 2015. Yeah. yeah, just a lot of design problems that I, I felt like were kind of unforced errors, like things that kind of worked and then they took them away to make them it, look It's absolutely or true. When the M1 came out, I was like, the yeah. Mac is back. You know, yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, this is it. This is this is the Mac we loved, uh, and innovation that we expected. Finally, I can put away all those Lenovo bookmarks that I've been bookmarking <laughs> yeah, exactly. over the past for the year I mean, before I, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I have I have uh, five of the M1 Mac Minis base unit, eight gigs, each pushing four 1080p streams out of wow. them. Wow. <laughs> you know, um, wow. it's just amazing. Yeah. These little, these little, the little, like six hundred ninety nine dollar machines is just doing. I just want to buy. I don't need one. I just want to buy one because they're so cute. <laughs> they just gotta, they're, so, they're so cool. I mean, actually, what I ended up doing, I, I kind of slapped myself in the head. I think I mentioned this because I was about to buy a Mac Mini for my desktop. And then I thought, oh, just all I need really is a dock for my M1 MacBook because it's the same thing, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's just a different form factor. But I do like that Mac Mini form factor, I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. You can even get a I, keyboard I, I, for it now, Leo. Oh, yeah. They've, uh, they've released the, uh, with the fingerprint reader, even. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Doesn't it, doesn't it look like that the the swing across the industry is moving away from facial recognition and back to fingerprint recognition because there's so much in Please, of the early enthusiasm. Let's. Yeah, I mean, I have on my the one of the few things that I. I really wish that I had fingerprint recognition on my uh, M1 iPad because. All I, as I'm picking it up, you know, you eat, you quickly get into the habit, like with my phone, whatever. As you're picking it up, you touch the, the you touch the pad, yeah. and, it's, and it's awake for it, unlock. Yeah. With the iPad, there's always that half second where I have to make sure pose. I'm facing. Yeah, it's, it's not as bad as that, but it's always oh, it oh, is not unlocked. Well, like, okay, because I have to. To me, maybe because I'm doing it in bed when I'm lying sideways. Sometimes True. you have I, I actually have to lift up and pose so that I can unlock it, uh, the phone or the iPad. It's really annoying. Just bring back the fingerprint. Please. Yeah. I, I would. I would love to have a finger. If I had a fingerprint well, reader on the keyboard, I would. I would not even care about no facial recognition on a desktop at yeah. all. Yeah. I also think that we're we're, we're at a point. At some point, we're going to get uh, either or. You know, you could do either or or both. You know, yeah, I think that's that we fine. are somewhere. If someone really wants to lock down their phone, I think there's some future where they say, "I want facial recognition and my thumbprint and my voice print." And, and all three the, have to be enacted or something. And yeah. a code, yeah. you know, like 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 four that's actually things, a great people idea. who really. Want. Yeah. And I think that, that when they put, the, I think you'll end up with all of them. You know, it won't yeah. be one of the. You can pick one, like, oh, I just want to go here with this, and I just want to use my thumb, or I, you know, whatever. Um, but I think that you could. What's going to be really interesting is the ability to use all of them together if you if you want to. So we'll get back to the results in a second. But since you since you mentioned it, here's the Magic Keyboard. 
uh, now oh, available sorry. for sale, both with 10 key and 10 key less. Uh, and there up in the upper right-hand corner is a little fingerprint reader. Now, you have to have an M1 Mac to use that, of course. Why is that, Renee? Is that... Yeah, it'll it'll pair with any Mac. Like, you can use it as a Bluetooth keyboard for any Mac, but they're using an authentic... Like, because you need to secure the keyboard as well. You don't want anyone right. to just, you know, use any keyboard. So, they have an actual authentication. They're not, they're not calling it a chip. They're calling it a block, and I'm not sure what they mean by that. They couldn't do that with a T2 in, in an Intel Mac? It seems like the T2 could do that. I mean, they could do anything, but they, they always... Like, how much is it worth us putting the time and engineering yeah. resources into doing it for an older system when we don't have... And then people complain. And like they changed their minds about um, the the live text on on Intel Macs last week, and maybe they'll change their minds about this at some point. But right mm -hmm. now, the engineering resource is pairing between the M1, which is a much newer uh, secure enclave, than the yeah. old A10 one in the T2. Do we know if the to fingerprint Alex's reader point, on this the keyboard? Re I'm sorry, good. Do, do we do we know if it works on no, the was, iPad as well? No, it does. The iPad doesn't have any. Right now, the Mac keyboards have a total understanding of the iPad, which is why you can use universal control to control any Mac or iPad with the iPhone keyboard, the Apple keyboard, but it doesn't go the other way around yet. So uh, they haven't okay. built anything that lets the, the, the iPad understand the Mac keyboards yet, but I'm hoping that's coming because it's such a no-brainer. Yeah. That'd be nice. One thing if I, was gonna I had add, the M1 iPad Pro, it'd be really nice if you could use this keyboard with it. It'd be really great. The one thing that I heard, too, is that the Face ID is coming. It's just a couple of years out still because there's a lot of security stuff they have to do to lock that down the way that Apple is doing it. But like to Alex's point, for the opposite of Alex, for like all of us normal people, we don't want five different locks on our on our device. We just want all those locks to come to us. So I don't. I should never have to fingerprint it. I should never have to Face ID it. It should just, anytime I touch the screen, take a snippet of my fingerprint. Anytime I look at it, take a, a glimpse of my face, hear my voice, judge my gait, and just say, oh, the trust threshold is met. I know it's Renee. I'm, never, I'm not going to be locked. I'm not going to force him to unlock me like an animal. I'll just be open <laughs> until that trust threshold is low, and then I'll force him to do like an active um, yeah. um, unlock if authorization if he needs to. And then Alex can put all five on if he wants to. Yeah, you, benefit I, I love that. And maybe have a, a adjustable thr trust threshold yes. and say, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a candidate for Congress, so I'd like to turn it all the way up. Or, or, or I'm a podcaster, so I just want to turn it all the way down. Or even location-based. Yeah. I'm when oh, I'm yeah. at home. I want it to be yeah. really. I still want the some, some security, but not easily. a ton. Yeah. If I walk, if I leave this re radius, or if yeah. I don't, if I go to somewhere unusual, I want Love you to that. take lock that all the way down. Love that idea. Idea. Yeah. Uh, nine to five Mac assumes, and I think they're probably accurate that this was not available. This keyboard earlier because they wanted to make sure they had enough for the uh, yes. new, uh, new iMax. And, and once, no colors. No colors. Only That's white. disappointing. Yeah. yeah. I know. Well, too many SKUs. They don't want too many SKUs. All right, back yeah. to the graphs. <laughs> <laughs> Those come in colors. Uh, this is an interesting category. Wearable home accessories. Used to be the other category, uh, but this is the Apple Watch, the iPod, I, uh, uh, the HomePod. Um, what other accessories? AirPods. That kind of thing. And don't look at the uh, the bars because there's those traditional, Apple has made them famous spikes on the first quarter of every year. But look at the yeah. black line, which is four quarter average. And man, is that a very nice upward curve. Very steady. Real growth there in that category. Yeah. The question is always going to be how much of it is due to uh, more people getting into this product line versus how much of this is based on extension of the product line. We do have the uh, they do they did. Ha well, that's why I like it that it's smooth because there's not like bumps yeah, when yeah. a new product came out. It really feels like it's just a continuous growth without any real bumps in there, which I think is good. Yeah, and the size it's, of it's the also, AirPod business. Wow. Well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, was, I was gonna say when you th when you th all the, this category is so much AirPods and the, it's it just goes to show more than Apple, watches. I, you think? I think the, the thing is, uh, watches they, they've been they've done a great job at making them affordable and accessible, but the it's AirPods hard to are swallow still, your watch, I guess. I mean, every everybody <laughs> there, there there are people who don't really so much care about their fitness, but they do care about listening to Motorhead or right, whatever. Right. So I think and also, <laughs> That's and a whole also the, group the entire of people line actually is a fairly large well, like that, well, they, 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 get, they, they get their exercise like mostly the, the neck, you know, stuff like that. 
<laughs> but still, it, I think I think it's I think it does indicate that I, I there are times where I wish that Apple would get a little bit into consumer electronics because boy, if they if if they could make a if they made the, those those ear, earbuds multi platform or e sorry easily multi platform as opposed to eh okay I guess if you have an Android phone we we won't we we won't it, we don't we won't inten intentionally Scrooge the Bluetooth protocol so that you can't use it with them but if they make things that are that can be multi platform Platform, multi-platform, boy, Apple styling, Apple design, Apple reliability, Apple service, those are huge wins for any consumer, and I wish that they would do more of it. And, and I guess I, on the other side of that, I just, I, I, I still think that, like, even just Apple TV on the on the TVs is, is kneecapped their ability, to, I mean, kneecapped a lot of us on our ability to serve up content because um, the TVs are, are so painfully Ugh. underpowered. Yeah. And so the thing is, is that you end up with, when you do external when you make it available to external folks, you have to deal with them underpowering everything, right. you know, and, and so they, so then that's a whole nother, Poor you have your brand, yeah. you have your brand out there in something that we now have to, you know, we can't deliver what we want to deliver that, that we can easily on my end, we're delivering really high quality video and on all the Apple made products made in the last two years, that's nothing. Like it's nothing for us to do. And for everything else, including the TVs with Apple TV, it's, a thing. That's a really good perspective. Uh, you kind of lose control over the experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think that's a, and 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 it hurts you as a as an end user or producer of content. That's right. a very interesting point. Here's the uh, services revenue. Also, a very nice steady growth in the black line. Uh, services revenue now seventeen point five billion dollars. Uh, App Store mostly. It's still probably a huge... It ain't Apple TV App Plus, Store. I, I can tell you that. <laughs> I mean, they count App Store subscriptions as Apple subscriptions. That gives you an idea of the scale of yeah, the App Store still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, year over year services revenue changed 33% growth year over year. iPad also very, very nice. Uh, you could see a, the iPad pretty flat right up to the second quarter of 2020 with the release of the uh, new iPad Pros and then just a very nice steady growth right there over, yeah. over a period of four or five quarters. So that's good. That's good news, yeah? I like the iPad. I'm, I'm glad that they are doing it. I, I just saw an article from a, a non-Apple trade magazine saying there really is only one tablet. It's not even worth yeah. considering anything else. It's like the iPod market. Yeah. They just don't. I mean, I don't... Yeah. I can't use it for everything, but the M1 iPad is the best computing it's device amazing. I've ever owned. It's amazing. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just the most pleasurable. There's just so many things I can do with it. You know, I have LiDAR and I have, uh, and I can draw on it and I can, you know, do a lot of things. It's just, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's not literally true, uh, only because uh, there are, uh, Samsung does make, if you, if you must, <laughs> if you if you're so if for whatever reason including you just don't want to write don't want to use the useful thing that everyone else is using uh samsung's galaxy tablets are nice if you want to if you want a productive productivity based tablet but there really is nothing that functions like an ipad there are lot there are lots of tablets that are good for reading lots of tablets like uh the amazon has i think they do require they do deserve a lot of props for making fire tablets for here's a less than hundred dollar color tablet for the back seat of the car that you're not you're, you're still going to teach your kids to treat things uh, well and not break them but if they break this tablet you will be pretty cool with it and wait a month before buying another one uh, but yeah that's that's an, it's not a technically true statement but in practice yeah absolutely true and that's what an amazing accomplishment any other uh, takeaways from the quarterly results? I mean, the one I, I, I think of is Tim Cook admitting in the analyst call that they are going to be hurt by chip shortages, not shortages yeah. of their flagship chips, yeah, the uh, A, A16 nodes. or whatever and the M1s, but but of these, Just what the he calls legacy nodes. chips. I, I think yeah. that the most, the most interesting word used in the entire event was the word legacy. I think that tells us that within the next two to three years, mm. Apple will not have any external chips. Yeah. Like the fact that they use the word legacy, I don't think is by accident. And I don't think it came off the cuff. I think it's saying that these are the old, this is the old way. And I think that we're going to probably see them transition slowly away from uh, all the external chips. Um, because it, again, they're also empowering all these other companies to, to keep up with them. When they take all that away, it means that all those foundries don't have the same volume. 
um, that they're not moving as fast. It, it's it's a huge impact for Apple to say that we're going to get rid of basically every other piece of silicon other than what we what we have. Legacy nodes. Yeah, that does imply that the... It's a bit of an industry term for anything like like 90 nanometers and over. And Apple's at 5 nanometers and TSMC's announced 2 nanometers, yeah. which to me starts to belie the world, like the laws of quantum physics. Yeah, well, that's why we're we're calling it... We're they, Intel no longer calls it 2 nanometers. They call it 20 angstroms. Which kind of is a... Like all measuring differently I, to begin I, with. Mag angstroms are what you measure the frequency of light waves light, with. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is such, it's such an amazing red, thing. Red, 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 and if, if you want proportion, the color red is 6,000 angstroms, not yeah. like 60, 600,000. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So but we're talking the, the, 20 angstroms. Yeah. I don't, you know. But they don't want, they don't want. A These are either atom distances like, now we're talking about. I mean, right, they're exactly. so small. Previously, like Intel's 10 nanometer was roughly equivalent to TSMC's 7 nanometer. And they don't, they don't want us. It's like when you have different like model numbers, so you can't compare cross-border shopping. They kind of do that to us so we can never see whose process is ahead or not so but like long story short there intel and and t is a little bit behind they they're very confident they're going to catch up but probably not <laughs> samsung and tsmc are they're optimistic are they're very optimistic that someday we shall figure out how to make yeah. a 20 angstrom chip like qualcomm's like we're going to catch up to apple really fast but they're never going to catch us in modems and it's like well which which one is it yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. just pick one the, the one thing that I, one thing that I was keeping keeping an eye out for that I thought was interesting was that I don't believe in, in uh, either the call or the uh, Q and A. They mentioned anything about uh, the, how they feel uh, regulatory pressures in the future is going to affect anything coming up in the near oh, future. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah. that's which is which is fine. I think that I think that means that they're unlike <laughs> unlike Amazon, unlike Google, they have no fraction of a billion dollar fines that have been applied in the next in the past uh, two or three months. But it also means that they don't feel like there's enough pressure that they'd be forced to say here's what we're going to have to change we're going to have to we're going to be impacted by what we expect to be a sea change in the way the ftc regulates technology and what congress has planned for the next year yeah, or that's two. that's an interesting omission yeah uh back to the supply constraints he said the majority of constraints we're seeing are of the variety that i think others are seeing that i would classify as an industry-wide shortage he says we all do we also see some shortages where the demand has been so great beyond our expectations, it's difficult to get the entire set of parts within the lead times. What would that be? The iPad, the that's Mac? That's every year, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, wow. You wanted, you wanted to sure. buy a lot of these, huh? Okay. <laughs> they um, almost never have enough chips. Like, they're bleeding as chips. They almost never have enough supply. It takes a while to get those. Sometimes yeah. the new screen technologies, like mini-LED, has been constrained. So constrained that apparently we were supposed to get those new MacBook Pros back at WWDC. I think that's the real constraints. constraints. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So we have to wait now until September. They said the shortages affect stuff. iPad and Mac, but not, of course, the iPhone. Um, he did say... Uh, a couple of months ago, the supply constraints could be a three to four billion dollar drag on sales, but he said uh, this time uh, that Apple was able to navigate and reduce the impact, so it wasn't as bad as they thought. We were the told matured, CNBC like we're actually able to mitigate some of that, and we came in at the lower than the low end part of the lower than the low end part of that range. <laughs> and, like, and the I, the iPhone is really mature right now. Like what the, what they're iterating on. Whenever they introduce a new a big new technology in the iPhone, it has the same problem. But the, like last year, they couldn't do 120 hertz because Samsung just could not make the panels. So instead of it being constrained, they just didn't do it. And this year, that Samsung can make a ton of those panels, so there's not going to be as much of a constraint. So any gonna, any other um, any other takeaways from uh, the the results last week? Anything else? To say he took zero <laughs> pot shots at Tesla, uh, unlike, <laughs> unlike Tesla, <laughs> who took aisle. two, he not took one, zero pot shots. two pot shots at, at Apple. At Tesla Elon, the, <laughs> yeah, well, that shows you when you're the big guy, you don't have to shoot down. It's only the little guys shooting up. That's yeah. you know. <laughs> also, also that if, if the if the producers of Ted Lasso had any reservations about wow. really sticking to Apple for contract negotiations, yes. it's like the fact that this is yet another time where Tim Cook called out. Not called out this one show as a point of pride, almost as though it was an iPhone, almost as if it was uh, the the yeah. the M1 chip. Yeah, they so they they know what they got there. I haven't watched the new season. Is it is it keeping up the it's quality? It's so good. Is it? Yeah. Mm. It's so good. Yeah, it's, it's like I got like hit by lightning, Leo. That's how it feels like. How, how do they? Uh, so when they started Apple TV Plus, they would release three episodes and then one by one, week by week. How are they doing the second season of Ted Lasso? Week by week or? Week by week. Week. Oh, so they're mm, okay. So yeah, I a lot of times I just get, wait until the whole thing's bread. out and, and binge it. 
you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good good reference. I got that. Shortbread, <laughs> the shortbread <laughs> reference. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Did they did they break out anything like Apple? They didn't break out Apple TV Plus or anything like that. Or no Apple mm -hmm. TV. Did he did he say anything about a hobby? Any, anything like that? No, no. <laughs> there were no hobbies. There were no there hobbies. Were, there were no. Hobbies. There was no decoupage. No scrapbooking. <laughs> no. I think it would be it was, safe to say that the Apple TV is still a hobby, though. Yes. It's a pretty good hobby. Uh, I think. I think it is. I'm, I'm not even going to try to make an analogy here. I think it's something that helps Apple TV Plus look better. And, it's some, and if people are going to be coming into the Apple Store to buy something, it gives them something to buy rather than buying a Roku stick or a, a Firebox or, a, or a, a Google Box that costs about a quarter as much and does three quarters as much as the Apple TV. I think it's useful. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be on the, on the list if it was, wasn't pulling its weight. I, I think that it for the folks who use it, like me, I mean, it is my interface to media on my in my entertainment system. So it's yeah. it's I don't have anything. I mean, I have other things that I test on, in, you know, to look at. But what my family and what I use every single day, all day, is if it doesn't exist on the Apple TV, I don't know that it exists. Wow. <laughs> like, like other than when I'm doing a test, you know, wow. like if yeah. it's not. Like for the for my home entertainment, so I, and I'm not like when I talk to people, there's a lot of people like that. Like it's easy, it's simple. They don't have to think about it. They don't, you know, it just works. It's secure. It's private. No, no, it's it's true. On you. I have all the streamers, and I it just it's the default. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, it's I not the best know. hardware. I got to say, I have to reset mine frequently. Uh, I think the thermals are a problem with really? it. Yeah. Is it you a new one? Yeah, I don't. Have I to have do. several of them, and yes, they all have the same problem. They get I haven't. they get wanky and janky. Resetting it fixes it. Uh, I think I, it's a I heat have to problem. maybe I, I probably reset it two or three times a year. Like there's usually something. You're right that there's something that gets locked up in it. But I've never. I mean, it's it's very rare. For it's me, like it's oh, an just app. It's, yeah. you think it's an app? One of the yeah, app. app stops navigating, and then I have to re reset it. Yeah, where do I where do I have the problem the most? Um, For me, it's a YouTube app or the Amazon app. Just because. It, yeah, yeah like it might be the Amazon app. Um, yeah, the apps crash. I mean, there's definitely things where poorly written apps, like uh, yeah. uh, like Universal's app for a while was just uh, horrible. Yes. You know, like it just, it, it was so bad. And it was, I'm sure that it had something to do with it. It was just the way it was doing long ops or whatever. It was just handing you fo footage that it wouldn't play back. So is there um, a way but, to cl force close an app and restart it? Yes. Oh, there I is. You double click the home button and then you flip it up like you're, get, yeah. like you're throwing away the card. Oh, so it's just like on, a, on an iPad. Mm -hmm. So double clicking yeah. the home button brings up a list of all the apps yep. that are running and you can see the host way the home the TV button, the one that has a little TV set. TV on. button. TV button. Oh, that's good to know. So I will do that because I've been restarting thinking it's thermals, but now I will just force close the app and restart the yep. app. That might solve the problem. The, last night we're watching uh, uh must have been Peacock because we were watching uh mm -hmm. Yellowstone. And the show starts and you know how it has a little loading thing? It just stays there. It does, there's and a, rat, a yellow the circle on the screen, and so a lot I go, of the network apps aren't Apple TV apps. Just they're just cross-compiled OpenGL apps that they okay. bring over from their smart TVs, okay. and then those. So I should start whole, blaming the apps, not the Apple well, TV. and also the if, <laughs> if, if the whole thing so freezes, if, blame if, the Apple TV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. If if it does that, and you go to another app, and it works perfectly, then it's the app. So it's you know. Oh, I so understand. If you, I, I, so that but if, if it gets hung up on that, it's not it's not the Apple TV though. It's the, it is, um, you know, people. But I close, I, well, maybe because I close the app, I get out of it, and the audio is still playing. <laughs> the other thing yeah, I know is the Apple too. TV is every once in a while it'll start glitching where the whole interface goes to snow and then it starts playing and then it goes to snow again and starts playing. Maybe I have a several wow. bad units. I think that's a heat problem myself, but yeah. uh, I don't know. Sometimes a hard is it, reboot is it, is required. Is it wedged between stuff? No, it's out in the. It's not in the open air. It's in a cabinet, but the cabinet door is open, and it's got six inches above it, and left and right, a couple of three inches. Mm -hmm. so it's a little disappointing it, how many how many weird hardware problems are solved when you just go to eBay, order like a simple like a fan heat sink, yeah, and just and, and whatever whatever feels hot on the bottom of this thing that keeps restarting itself, you just put a heat sink on the bottom of it, and yeah. oh dear, that's all that was maybe required maybe that's what I move see, and, and but that's a flaw in you Apple's see the design. PlayStation upgrade, right? Leo. Where, no. where you can finally get the new storage for your PlayStation. We got to buy your own heatsink. <laughs> of course. <laughs> hey, if you're buying, why not? Why sh why wouldn't you do that? Microsoft is just you slip in the new storage. PlayStation is like here. This is a drive you need to buy. It has to be one of these drives, <laughs> and, and you can find a heatsink for it. Oh, just go Lord. out and find one. Find a heatsink. Jeez. 
Um, that famous Sony Fit and Finish we all know and love. And also, we're also we're out of paper towels, so if you could buy some <laughs> while you're out and just send them to us, it would really help us out a lot. Because apparent because apparently you are our our, our delivery system for, for for component design. And you you know you can reboot by just holding down the two buttons, right? Like you're not getting up. Yeah, that's how I reboot. Yeah, sometimes though I have to actually go and unplug it, and I think that because of thermals is it's cooling down enough Maybe. to yeah yeah but uh, yeah more, usually i just hold on to buttons but i like this hold down the tv then it, you could swipe it off that may be Double that may have all, been all i needed to do last night when i was having the circle yeah. stay there on peacock um how's peacock i haven't peacock. used it um uh, the only reason i have it and pay for it is because of a couple of shows that we like to watch that are on it uh yellowstone's a great show if you haven't seen yellowstone yet Highly yeah, recommend. We get that on Crave. I, I got um, it. I have to admit, I went to. I was like, oh, the Olympics. I'll, I'll, I'll sign up for Peacock. Oh no, 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 for no. my email. I <laughs> there is one email, solution. The, I was like, nope. The mess of the Olympics, which is horrific, and everybody's complaining as they do every four years or five in this case. Uh, the big solution to me is use YouTube TV, and then there's yeah. a button that says record everything. <laughs> That's what I did. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way. I hate oh, I hate myself for doing it, but I paid the twenty bucks a month for four K. But now I have four K HDR, and I can watch any event because it's on YouTube TV. It's it's figured out all the different ways to get it. That's that's so, by far the easiest way to do it. I think it's the uh, now I can't remember. I think it's Channel Seven in Australia. If you if you're able to VPN in and oh. get it, it's all the feeds. <laughs> like oh. It's all the Olympic feeds. Live. Well, they're in the same like, time like, it's like zone, forty right some. There. Yeah, it's like forty some uh, feeds or whatever yeah. that are all all available if you can find your you way. Still, to, if, you, if your bits can come from Australia, we'll just say. Yes, yeah. my method it's unfortunately a, does not eliminate the foolishness that NBC does to all of this, but at least I have a I was, recording. Yeah, it. I was I, I was about to say that one of the big changes in watching the events like this has been realizing it is how much good how much better almost every other country's coverage of a sports event is yeah. because. Mm -hmm. When you watch the BBC, it's like they understand the idea that wow, there's something happening that requires no beheaded beheaded uh, commentary. We can just actually let this beautiful thing happen, and as a moment, as opposed to say, and now, Elon <laughs> Fetchovich is picking up for the pick up the shot put. Let's cut to an interview with Elon that we did four months ago. Wait, 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 wait that's in a, San that, Diego. That's, that, <laughs> that sounds like a foreign name. Is it a foreign name? <laughs> I'm sorry. We, just, we let, let's go. Let's go. Let's cut away to this. Uh, this, this American Olympian How to who's pronounce. just sitting drinking water. Yeah, there you go. It's, <laughs> but you know what? This complaint is every four years. It's just a, a regular yeah. thing. So, Can't, stop making me try to feel about things. Just show yeah. me stuff. I'll feel. They don't trust. They don't trust. This is historically the problem with uh, network television well, in the United States. They don't trust the audience. Maybe they're old, right. They may know. It's something. just old media. It's old media. It's old media. Yeah. I mean, it's old media. There's a there, there's a calculation. Okay, now we do this thing, and now we do this thing, and there's a little model, and how do we put this little box in the? How do we put this in the box? And there's boxes, and you have to fill the boxes with the right. things, and they yeah. they have a formula that they've decided works, and whether it does or not is you know they made money as much money as they needed to on the last one. The problem they have this one is that they're just bleeding capital now. I mean, it's yeah, it's pretty ugly. Oh, it's just you know we're watching the demise of the old media. That's fine. I don't yeah. mind. As an old media guy, Seven. Uh, I'll just retire when it's all over. <laughs> Seven plus, by the way, that's oh, the channel that I think does them. <laughs> Seven plus. Now, in Australia, I could VPN there. I wonder if I can somehow get BBC VPN. I wonder how that yeah, you can always VPN. Yeah. <laughs> you just I, I plow They're always trying to shut down the. They're VPNs. very, they're very cagey. They, yeah. They're, they're also getting better and better about finding. Hi, you know you, you, the subreddit that keeps posting, posting recordings of all of our stuff, like the day after a post. We'd like you to stop doing that. Yeah. Please yeah. listen to our lawyers. Uh, Andy Inako, WGBH Boston Inako.com, Renee Ritchie YouTube.com, slash Renee Ritchie, Alex Lindsay. The author of the new book, This Land is My Land. No, no, I'm sorry. I had the wrong <laughs> script. Uh, I'm trying to order it right now. 090.media, officehours.global. Uh, is Elon Musk going to be the next CEO of Apple? <laughs> <laughs> this is embarrassing. I think I'm he so, doesn't want to be CEO so of Tesla. Levels. Yeah. So this is a book which uh, is written by Tim Higgins, who's a respected Wall Street Journal reporter. It comes out next month. It's called Power Play. Tesla, Elon Musk, and the bed of the century. And I'm sure it's well reported. But somehow, 
somehow they got uh, Tim got you say a, that Leo, but <laughs> somehow he got a story that there was a conversation when uh, apparently uh, Elon and Tim Cook met to talk about Apple buying Tesla. There was a conversation in which Elon Musk said, "Okay, but I have to be the CEO of Apple," and in which Tim Cook said, "F you," and hung up on him. Now none of this is credible at all. Both parties have denied it. In fact, both Tim and Elon said, "You know what? We've never even talked to each other. We've never even met." Yeah. Before, before and you know Elon wouldn't hesitate. Out, that, that was <laughs> yeah. But before this book came out, that was like what they were saying on both sides. I think uh, Elon in his. Uh, Oddly, out of character for him, him being such a reticent fellow, uh, did mention that, boasted that, oh, well, Apple had a, I, I reached out to Apple years ago. They could have bought the, my entire company for pennies, but he wouldn't even return my phone call. Yeah. Uh, it is, I mean, it would kind of make sense hour. if Apple wants to uh, do an Apple car that they kind of need a car manufacturer. Uh, I don't think they want to get in that business, but maybe, maybe they think they do. I don't know. They just want it to be someone in Germany, not... <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it would be a mistake to pick to get in bed with Elon. Right. And I'm just saying that, that to you, Grimes, yeah, and everybody else. Yeah. Don't, don't, that, one, that conversation one, sounds... One tweet, one tweet and your entire retirement fund <laughs> is like, okay, I guess I'm working until 74 now. Yeah. Thank ahead, you very Alex. much, Elon. <laughs> I just think that the 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 idea that that it's conversation not happened yeah. is, it's so not incredible. Incredible. is so incredible. It, like, yeah. just not... Not even possible. I mean, the, the the idea that that Tim Cook would say that to another CEO of no. any kind no. is just that Steve Jobs might have said. Like, if they said that Steve yeah. Jobs said that, I would be like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But Tim Cook, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you know, that, that's Tuesday for yeah. Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And did exactly. Elon want Apple to buy Tesla with Dogecoin? Because that would have <laughs> maybe, maybe it was real. Like, I, maybe then I would believe. Mac it. report says, and it is a rumor that Apple is expanding its California self-driving test fleet. To 62 cars and 90, 69 cars and 92 drivers. Uh, maybe they're looking at, uh, maybe they're looking at uh, actual filing. So maybe it isn't quite a rumor. Um, that is down though stuff, from like October 2020 when Apple they reported that Apple had 154 driver permits. So it is it is not an increase. Yeah. Do you know that uh, Apple's actually filed uh, the. Uh, the government agency has a has a voluntary voluntary program for companies that are developing self driving cars uh, to say a file a report that explains what your testing procedure is, what Good. technologies you're using, Good. what your certification yeah. plan. Tesla has not filed such a report, but Apple has. Yeah, good for Apple. Which I found very interesting. Yeah, uh, this from the California Department of Motor Vehicles collisions. Apple has had three. Of course, Waymo's had 111. That's Waymo. Uh, that's Google's well, they're self But they can afford a Veritasium video, so they're fine. Yeah. I, you know, it also is related to how many miles driven and, and right. so forth. Uh, but I, it's, I think it's interesting. I mean, there's no question because of these filings that Apple is absolutely, you know, working on self-driving vehicles. And they have increased the number of cars. Decrease the number of drivers, but increase the number of cars. Yeah. I think but someone else whole post thing is like centered on going to... Sorry, Andy. I'll just, I'll just just quickly there, and it, it is actively evolving. It's not as though they are building a platform and just for testing software, and right. software is the only thing they're intending to do. There was an up someone uh, sp there's on one of the uh, autonomous vehicle blogs uh, had updated photos of a Apple car sighting just a few weeks ago, which they compared to a previous sighting of about a few months earlier, noting that there are new sensors on the side of the car that weren't there before, and they had changed some of the mm. sensors that are on the top. So it is a, it is a hardware project as much as it, is a software project, which I, think, I would not have bet money on. I think also you're kind of waiting for the market to get to a certain point when it comes to self-driving, when it comes to, you know, Apple has time. You know, they don't need to make the money. They're not a car manufacturer. So they can work out a lot of the details um, and be figuring those things out. I mean, I think that as a user, I when I saw Google put up a, a car with no driver seat, like just like you're just going to get That's in and it's going to drive you around. Yeah, I thought that was cuckoo. Now I wouldn't buy a self-driving car that actually had make makes me. Like, I just want to get in a box well, that it, takes me to the place that I want to go. Well, that's that's the that's the ideal. But there's a, there's a I think it's bad that for the entire for the entire platform for the entire. Uh, 
entire industry that Tesla is the name that's most closely associated with autonomous vehicles because they're the one they're the one company that is absolutely not doing that. They're also the company that is doing the most squirrely things to get these cars on the road. You have Intel, you have Apple, you have Google, all of whom are doing real in-depth for real uh, investigations going very, very cautiously and making sure that they're always doing things that are fully in line with federal and state guidelines. But then you have Tesla, which are actively saying one thing when they're speaking to California transportation regulators, but saying another thing, or okay, Elon, but uh, but still, uh, when they're talking to the public, they they keep t they keep t talking to. Uh, uh, there's a transcript of uh, the conversations with uh, California state regulators saying that no, 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 this is level two driving yeah. only. Believe me, if we ever do level three or above, we will not do that until we talk to you guys and get the proper permissions and certifications. But meanwhile, here is if any they have beta pe people driving beta software that is doing self driving on on like city regular like residential roads not just uh, lane assist on highways and that's that sort of playing cute with the rules is a i think reckless and b it just makes me not respect how they're approaching the enormity of this problem do well, self driving uh, do is really fun in Ara sorry no please I was going to say self-driving is a lot of fun when you're sitting in a headquarters watching your car move three inches in the Arizona desert. It's very different <laughs> when you live where Andy and I live and snow is indistinguishable from walls. Right. Like you, you, you very seldom exactly. see people doing all these demos in the middle of a Boston or Montreal winter. So there's, there's a long way to go and Apple has quite a bit of runway to get there. Uh, how do we feel about spatial audio now? It's been out for a while. I've pros and cons from people and... You know, part of it is that uh, we're Depends producers song, are starting yeah. to learn how to do it better. Yeah. Um, do we like it still? Are we still excited? I know you were pretty excited about it, Alex. You you still are? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I you know, so. I I can tell the difference. I hear the difference. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I need it. I still I, think stereo I, sounds pretty I, good, but I guess if I had the choice, I'd choose spatial audio. I, I think that I I think that what I'm hearing the hard part right now is that is that the um, the issue is Apple's making everything sound better. So they're doing some kind of processing to mm. all the songs that make them all sound a little bit better than what they did in old stereo. They're doing something that dimensionalizes them. I don't know what it is, but I can hear it even in songs that aren't necessarily in some Apple's. automated way. So, but the ones that are designed, what you're hearing is hit and miss. So right, right. now we're kind of in that, um, there's some, and, and a lot of this comes down, I think we talked about this before, the difference between, I think that music so the folks who have done tons and tons of surround movies really understand uh how to do this and the folks doing music some of them do but a lot of them don't see, seem to so so the the issue is is that and this is the primary issue that i'm hearing constantly is that they're choosing to one set of engineers is mixing the vocals down the center channel and one set is mixing down right and left. Right and left is a music engineer doing what they would do. R going down the center is a movie engineer doing what they do. Who, and most of the movie engineers have done this for a lot longer. Right. The, the effect on me is that I hear a, um, this kind of uh, echoey reverb thing between the two ears that isn't perfect or it feels phased or something. Yes, and I've heard the, that as well. Yeah. So that that's because someone mixed the the vocal down the two right and left instead of down the center track, oh. you know, and and so the center track is where you want to put the vocals, right. in my opinion. I mean, everybody has a different. Like if you listen, a perfect example is, and I talked about this before, Rush's um, Tom Sawyer is fills the the field the the music field more than almost any other song that I've heard in uh, in Apple Music, except for Getty Lee's. You know, his voice is coming down right and left and it has this weird kind of phasey sound thing. to me. Yeah, phasey yeah. thing to me. And so, so that's the, I mean, that's my, um, both, the, and you hear it more in a stereo, like I have seven, 7.2 7 at my, um, uh, or, or, yeah, anyway, so, um, uh, seven one at my house. And the, the problem you get into is, is that I hear it a lot more in my stereo than I do in the headphones. So, so anyway, so I think that it's, I, I, I still feel like it's the future. I think that, but I, I hear us wandering, like there's song, I we're think we're just in that growth period. It. We're People, still learning. A lot of engineers are, are doing it. And a lot yeah. of what we need to do is have a big conference between surround engineers <laughs> to talk to each other, trade notes, figure out what's better, 
break things down. We're going to, I'm going to get a, um, one of the surround engineers that I know to probably do something in office hours. And we're going to, you know, where we just literally break down some songs. <laughs> Let's talk about the songs. A listener sent and, me a great podcast. And yeah. Darn it. I can't remember what it was. I'll have to look at my, but, uh, yeah. where they did get a guy who is doing a lot of, uh, spatial who actually mm -hmm. built a studio so that he could do it. Uh, he's a remix engineer and talks a lot about the issues involved. It was a very good podcast. If I can find it, I will. I will it's, tell you. It's what complicated. It was. I, 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 and I, I want to say that while I'm complaining about some of the mixes, learning how to do it is a thing. You know, I'm figuring out how to do it right now uh, myself as a as an exercise, and um, I'm taking something very simple. I'm literally taking the. Uh, the sound that your iPhone makes when it rings. I found the I found the MIDI for that. Well, I didn't find the MIDI. I found the XML for that. So I have it in Logic, and I'm like playing with all the stuff, and I'm kind of moving it around inside. I'm just going to use that one piece of music <laughs> to, 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 to do it. The Imbira, you know, that that Imbira thing to to, to kind of um, think through it. And and as soon as I got into it, I'm like, this is really hard. Like yeah. this is hard to think <laughs> yeah. to think about. And so um, so anyway, so I, I have a lot of respect for the the engineers that are doing it. Um, I think that that's, the, you know, a lot of them, uh, the, the, some of the best ones are really subtle and I love listening to it. The problem I'm having right now is that I'm so distracted when I listen to them. I can't do it. I can't play music and listen to it because when I hear it, I go, oh, I really like what they just yeah, did. Yeah. Like, like, you know, like, oh, this is, this is so nice. Yeah. It's so, font, like, it's, the it's, <laughs> yeah, it's not just music anymore. It's like, it's like, oh, they put that there. I, I don't know if I agree with that. You know, like, and, and, and you're, you're thinking about the music in a different way because it's so much richer. I mean, you can hear what I will say about spatial is that the spatial songs, more than it being more than stereo, you can, the, the detail on every instrument is way more, you know, you can hear more in the instruments um, their their actual nature than you could hear when they were all mushed together in stereo, you know, and I think that that's the thing that that I'm noticing is there's, there's more more detail in the music. Great interview in the Rolling Stone with Giles Martin, who is, of course, the son of uh, the Beatles' very famous uh, producer. Uh, I want to say Don Martin, but he was in that magazine. What's his name <laughs> anyway? Uh, uh, but in this case, Giles, who has who already was working with spatial sound because he remixed remember the beatles love was a remix for the cirque du soleil show in a spatial theater and uh, he talks he's actually said i'm unhappy with the sergeant pepper mix i did uh he says i'm going to change it it doesn't sound quite right to me it's out in apple music right now but i'm going to replace it it's good but it's not right sergeant pepper was the first album ever mixed in dolby atmos and we did it as a theatrical presentation uh, and he said, because it was mixed for the theatrical mix, it isn't quite right. He's going to make it into what he's what's called near field Dolby Atmos, as opposed to the cinema Dolby Atmos. He said you lose some bass uh, and so forth. Abbey Road, he says, is is better. He says it's a better functioning Atmos mix because it's much closer to the stereo mix sonically. And one of the things he did, I think, is fascinating. He said we can do this because we are. You know, Abbey Road, we're the Beatles. Uh, he talks about John Lennon's vocal on Day in the Life. Uh, he says, with the Beatles mixes, because we have, I suppose, the money to do it and the luxury of time, what I and engineer Sam O'Kell tend to do, as opposed to using digital effects, we place the speakers back in Studio 2, which is where the Beatles recorded at Abbey Road, <laughs> and we will re-record John's voice in Studio 2 so what you're hearing is the reflections of the room he's singing in. So it's more accurate. You know, my, must be nice. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> must Just be think nice. think of when they thought of doing that. Like they're out drinking, you know, like probably some, you know, and... and Maybe drinking. Anyway, so, uh, but they're like, why don't we just put a speaker in there? Yeah, yeah. We could and just then, then record probably it. like three yeah. or four months of them trying to figure out how to record that speaker yeah. perfectly, yeah. you know. And, it's actually yeah. a really good article if you're interested in spatial audio and the challenges. I mean, nobody knows better probably than Giles Martin. Nobody's had more experience yeah. with it. That, that's a, that's such an interesting... Uh, George, uh, by the way, was his father. Thank you. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's such an interesting philosophical question because uh, this is maybe an ideal situation for the remix because uh, you, uh, Paul McCartney is still alive. Uh, there is at least the DNA of what the original producer 
intended or thinks is right or wrong because the original remixes were done with uh, George had had input uh, as they were as they were doing it. Uh, but what happens when it's like twenty or thirty years from now and someone else they, they're not they're not even trying to make a, a, they're not even trying to change it into something that it isn't. But they just said you know with this new technology we can really bring that bass line up and out and make it more noticeable. Like maybe they decided not to make the bass very noticeable. There's a there's also part of this conversation would be that there's a really nice documentary series on Hulu. I think it's Paul McCartney 321, where he and a producer, I can't remember his name, but he's legendary, uh, are at the mixing board with like the mixing tapes for so, so much of his hits from the Beatles on forward. And so much of it is talking about the construction of these songs, like uh, them bringing up the bass line and noticing that the, Paul on this one song was almost doing like an entirely different melody, which is not something that you notice at all in this Beatles song. But maybe you're not, maybe if you notice that he was playing like a, a complimentary melody instead of just an accompaniment, it would be a totally different song. So as these technologies come forward, as we have the ability to uh, add like 3D to 2D television and do it through artificial intelligence and machine learning, as opposed to uh, uh, reprocessing it with thoughtful human uh, intervention by the director. Are we creating things that never existed and that the original creators never intended all in the interest of creating topsy turvy tinsel and gloss that this thing never actually needed in the first place just to make it more commercial. That's the thing about Beatles stuff. You 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 do that at your own peril because Beatles fans are yeah. very very clear and very outspoken. He says uh, we don't fix errors. He says sometimes when you right. do these remixes, you can hear uh, because you're listening to the vocal track alone, you can hear the vocalist be pitchy or something. He said, but that's what made the, the record good right. in the first place. He right. says we this is real. I highly recommend this article. He says we start off with the stereo. I feel immersive audio should be an expansion of the stereo field in a way. I like the idea of a vinyl record melting and you're falling into it. That's the analogy I like to use. The other thing he says is, uh, he says, be careful about using the surround. He says, we are by nature forward-facing individuals who don't like too many things creeping up behind us. And sometimes <laughs> yeah. I will with, with Dolby mixes and movies. I remember the first time I had a surround sound system, watched a ball game, and the beer guy was coming from behind me. It <laughs> freaked me out. Yep. He says, if you have a lot of sound coming from behind you, you want to turn your head. I get criticized sometimes for not being expansive enough with these mixes, but it's what I believe. I like the idea of falling into the record as opposed to being circled around. I, I think we're, we're in that that place, though. I mean, when when Logic and, and when people get better at using Resolve and, and Fair, Fairlight in, in Resolve, and as well as Logic uh, really becomes when it supports it natively, which is supposed to be this fall, uh, when those things happen, I think you're going to see the same thing that happened with spatial, as you saw with Photoshop, is that there's a lot of things that people thought were useful in advertising and layout and everything else. And and then, you know, it was all very stodgy and this is the way it was because you had all these Cytex operators that went to school and learned all these things and you had design people who went to school and they went to CalArts and they there was a way to do it and everything else. And then all these Photoshop users, those were me, <laughs> that was me, <laughs> um, we got it in 1991, 1992, and we went crazy, and we made tons and tons of mistakes. Right. Like, I, I did. I, I once printed an ad in, in, New, in New Mexico that was fully black, because I didn't understand <laughs> that thing. It was, like, it was just a black square. When they sent, they sent you proof, you know, when they do a print ad, they sent me proof back, and I, I just hit it, because I was like, I don't think anyone wants to see this. We just spent $2,000 on a black square. And so, 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 they, so a lot of us got to play, and you know, you had Ray Gun, which was completely unreadable, and you had all these things that were that, that exploded out of it. And then what we've settled into over time was something that is much more interesting and much more aggressive. If you look at what 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 our print looked like in the late 80s and then looked at what it looked like in the late 90s, it had just moved a century. You know, and, and so I think that what we're going to see with spatial audio is we're going to see this explosion as the tools get easier. This explosion, every artist is going to design for it because it's going to be, you know, you have a better chance of being featured on Apple Music. And so you're going to, they're going to design for it. They're going to think about it. And some of it's going to be horrible and some of it's going to be amazing. And we'll find the language for doing this because now it's right now there's a handful of people that are doing it in a year, there'll be hundreds and more. And in, in two years, there'll be thousands more. And in three years, there'll be 10,000, you know, t th every artist will be thinking about it. And um, because of the, and, and, but they'll be thinking about it and, and it will take four to five years before we get to a point where we really have a language that makes sense. Yeah. 
No, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's like it's like 3D uh, in the early days where it's all about, hey, look, here's a new camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. But then, what but I can then do. you. But then you wind up with people like Martin Scorsese uh, in Hugo. You wind up even with Hitchcock uh, in Dial M for Murder, where it is a, a, a natural and a part of the storytelling. So, yeah, I, I, I'd be excited for when that actually really happens. Yeah. Uh, speaking of music, hey, here's some good news. Some new uh, guitar, I'm sorry, garage band uh, tracks. Sound packs from Dua Lipa, Lady Gaga, and other well-known music producers. So you can go in and do a remix session uh, for yourself. These are uh, these are really cool. I think these are so much fun. Was it Nine Inch Nails that did it first? It was really cool. Well, this is Nine Inch Nails is releasing the tracks. I wasn't clear looking at that release whether they're actually letting you walk away with the or tracks. Or you just get some that, loops and beats. I think they give you something. Well, uh, I think that they, they let you play with it in the store. Uh, you know, I don't know if they're letting you actually take the tracks with you. And, and maybe they... Yeah. Well, are they? Yeah, it's a Garage Band um, class. Oh, so yeah, so I, I got to talk to them about this, and it was—it's really interesting. So this was based on a class from the Apple stores that was like a ninety-minute class, right. but and people wanted to take it with them. They, they kept saying, "Can okay. we take this? Can we take this?" And so Apple's building it in, and so for those two artists, they gave Apple like the master tracks for that, and they Apple basically disassembled them or put all the parts in there, so you can go in and turn on or turn off different parts of the performance, and it's done almost like a spreadsheet, which is great for people like me with absolutely zero musical ability. Yeah. You just hit things and turn them on and you can bring in your own loops and they have producers like ash felder who's just like phenomenal at doing this kind of stuff who does all this stuff natively in in logic this is stuff anyway you can download or you can you can actually uh you get it at home you get, yeah you can get their packs yeah you can download their packs I, I don't know you can i don't know if you can take them out of this interface though like i don't yeah they I don't, don't want you, can, you like, remixing the, the songs from, yeah. and releasing them probably <laughs> well you can uh, well, I, I think you know, like their rights are going to be different, but all the Apple stuff are, are, is completely like you can do anything you want with all the Apple loops that are included in there, including commercial work. And they and now they have these producer back packs that have royalty free loops, beats, instruments, drum kits, yeah. synth synth patches. So and yeah, whole instruments. Yeah, yeah, really, really interesting. And they've done they've done Lady. I think Lady Gaga did, did one. She didn't she or no? It wasn't. It was. Um, There's a Gaga track on this. Was, yes, it's but there free was another. Woman. Yeah, there was another one where they released it in Logic, and I just can't think of the name of the song right oh, now. Oh, see, that's what I really... Um, then you can so really it was, do it, right? And it's like a master's course. Like, when you see someone bounce all the tracks into Logic mm -hmm. and, you, and you break it all down, that's when you really understand, like, number one is how complex these songs get. But also, you really um, see this incredible, like, how they built the song up and how they arranged it. Yeah, you it don't see they, that in any of this, which is too bad, because so it's not a learning experience, the, it's more like a toy. You know, well, this is also is, the I, only the iOS versions. Like, this isn't the Mac version yet. It's only the uh, the right. iPhone and the iPad version, so it's right, further right. in there. But back before the world ended, they when they were still doing this live, we got to sit in with Ash Felder, and he went over how I forget the artist. It was like Ariana Grande or somebody who oh, just Oak Felder into. Oakfelder, sorry, I apologize. Different Oak, tree. Different tree. Um, <laughs> yeah, Oakfelder. Uh, they would just they would just sing a few bars into uh, into voice memos and send it to him, and he'd be yeah. in the back of a car, and he would put it down, and then he would hum something and use logic to turn the humming into a chorus. Yeah. And he would just keep adding layer, and he'd go to his mom's house and keep adding it's more. It's a whole and more new way to, to collaborate, it, and then yep. send yeah. it back and forth to her, and she would tweak it, send it back, and he would do the entire song on his MacBook Pro at his mom's house, like yeah. just like right. fifty layers of of tracks. It's it really unbelievable. cool. It's changed it the creative process. Us, like right in front of us. Yeah, it's really changed the creative process. I remember uh, Steve Martin's uh, album he did with Edie Brickell. She would send him lyrics. He'd record it on the banjo. He'd record it on you know on his iPhone. <laughs> send her the uh, the recording, <laughs> and then she would. So they were going exactly the same thing. It changes yeah. the collaborative yeah. process. In this case, I think they went to a studio at the end, but that was the process of writing the song. It was very interesting. Yeah. And I think for the artist, there's this is a great great way to make money is have Apple just give you a lot of money to to release some tracks. And yes. so yeah, I'm and sure I think they did, that, right? that it's a and I think that they're I think I'm hoping that Apple will when they release Logic, they'll release a bunch of songs that are in Atmos, like are mixed for Atmos when they release the new Atmos. I mean, whenever they've talked about the fact they're going to release They need to, because they need to do show best practices for this, right? Yep, yep. And I think that that would be the best way to do it is to have songs that are really interesting that are that are pre-done that can be, um, that you can break down and understand how they did it. Yeah, really interesting. Uh, I don't, you know, China's complicated. Uh yes. And, <laughs> and and uh, in many, many ways. But uh, so uh, as we talked about last week, prototypes of the new iPhone have leaked out. 
uh, to a lot of sources. We talked about Marquez Brownlee's robot arm taking <laughs> beautiful video of the uh, iPhone prototype. Apple's lawyers in China have now sent a cease and desist letter uh, to a Chinese citizen who advertised these stolen <laughs> prototypes yep. on social media. This comes from Motherboard. Um, so this actually goes back to the iPhone 10, but I imagine uh, something similar is happening today with these prototypes. Um, and then, in a way, they th they threaten them. Uh, now, of course, again, it's Chinese lawyers working for Apple, but um, in a way, they threaten them with uh, uh, retaliation from the Chinese government. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're 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 doing something. That, excuse me, the people who are selling these these prototypes are doing something that's wrong. They they it's not. There are some headlines about this last week about Apple crushes unauthorized whatever whatever. So well, which is which would be terrible if they were trying to shut up people who were trying to report on news, which is something that came up in the headlines last month. But this is no. Someone is stealing something that is property and trying to sell that property. That but can, then they then ask these guys for a list of anyone who gave you the leaked devices they're trying to trace it back yeah but that's that's legit too i guess uh, if, yeah. if you if you're saying if you if, we, if you want if you want us to hit you in the head with a softer hammer let us <laughs> tell us tell us who you're mm. working with and there's a there's a lot of uh, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, folklore about how oh well it's china uh, it, uh, no one cares about copyright violations no one cares about intellectual property and it is a very very looser situation that we have uh, in the united states however no there's this is something that they they will get lots and lots of help with there are a lot of factories that are doing counterfeit whatever that get that get to operate for a while uh get to really hone their craft but then they get swarmed and shut down so it's not a huge problem it's still very much worth their while to try to produce knockoffs and do stuff like steal these uh these uh, uh physical samples and sell them on but it's not as though there's no recourse for this to happen so apple is apple is apple is cashing in on some of the goodwill that they've been building up with the chinese government over the past several years as soon as they sell their their people inside the government that this is super bumming us out, do something about this, there's going to be a big bag of hurt dropped on this entire industry. And then sometimes uh, companies leak the, uh, their own stuff. An Intel <laughs> executive uh, mistakenly, I think, published a, a photo uh, on uh, Twitter that uh, showed Thunderbolt 5 <laughs> and uh, some of the uh, specs, including 50 gig, I'm sorry, 80 gigabits. Uh, per second, which makes sense. That's doubling uh, Thunderbolt yeah. 4 and Thunderbolt 3. Um, he po he posted a picture with a poster on the wall showing... <laughs> show, you know, so it's like he wasn't doing it on purpose, showing the uh, latest technology, uh, an 80 gigabit uh, physical layer, and uh, uh, apparently PAM 3 modula modulation technology they took of course he immediately took it down but uh here's the okay. picture from a non-tech and of course Oops. somebody with this was the original picture somebody with sharp eyes zoomed in on it a non-tech has put its uh, zoom enhanced that a non-tech is not in the original picture that is that is to yeah. let everybody know that they got the scoop on this um so yeah you got to be Th careful is, what you're posting yeah. this was uh, intel's executive vice president and gm of the client computing group gregory bryant Careful what you yeah. post. You're, you're not going to get away we'll with see. it because the people who the people who specialize in news, uh, they are the people who they don't even like uh, make it a regular habit of checking out your Twitter feed. They actually have scripts that will download every single tweet yeah. that you make and keep it safe. So Just one second case. after you post it, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're you're not going to be able to take that down and take that back. Uh, and before we wrap up, a, a sad farewell to the cult of Mac magazine uh leander oh. connie posting his uh, farewell i wasn't clear from this uh whether on that they, they don't want me to have an ad blocker on here i'm sorry uh i'll, I'll continue without supporting just for the moment um I'm, i wasn't clear is this the paper magazine is this the website is it what is it that they're gonna discontinue i i should probably call leander he's been on our shows of course um, I don't know. I don't know. I, th I think I seem to remember it was digital, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't. It was designed for newsstand, um, mm -hmm. so uh, they published it as a standalone app. Leander writes, "We've seen readership slowly decline 
uh, especially with apps like News Plus and Flipboard. And, of course, there's Facebook and Twitter. Ironically, as readership of the magazine declined, we saw readership in the News Plus app pick up. Uh, but the, the digital magazine, the standalone yeah. app, Cult of Mac magazine, will discontinue RFP. after 411 yeah. weekly issues. That was a good run. And just, uh, just like we said before about Apple, it's great to be in the Electron business because Electrons are free. You can just scoop them up by the handful whenever you need some more. Yeah. Whereas producing and shipping a, uh, and, and marketing a physical product, boy, you need so much infrastructure these days that I'm amazed that anybody gets into that business at all. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And, of course, there was Leander published a book, The Cult of Mac, famously with a head shaved with an apple on, on the back <laughs> of it and so yeah. forth. Um, he's, he's one of the old guard. He's one of the old love, war horses of, of Mac guy. and yeah. Apple journalism. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just a little little note noting the passing of the digital cult of Mac magazine. Um, let's take a break. And when we come back, would you like to do your picks of the week, boys? Yes, would please. love to. I see you've filled them all in. You've done your, you've done your <laughs> jobs. Let's start the picks of the week with Andy and not co. Andy, go right ahead. Uh, first one is a follow-up. Uh, last week, a pick of the week was uh, that uh, Best Buy was like fire sailing uh, the previous generation Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro, the 12.9 the inch one. Normally 350 bucks, down to 199. Uh, I said that the day before I'd ordered one. Uh, the it of course arrived in a timely fashion. I put my iPad Pro 12.9 inch in it, and even though it was uh, the 2021 model and the keyboard was the 2020 model, it, I was expecting okay, well, it doesn't fit. No. Quite as well, but it's certainly you can't usable. tell the difference. Was, exactly. If, <laughs> yeah. you, if you if they had if if someone if someone on eBay had bought these for two hundred two hundred dollars and sold it to me as like a, a current generation one for three hundred and twenty, I would say, oh my god, I just saved thirty dollars on this is great. So it just is a quick a quick note that they're still on they're still available for sale at one ninety nine, and don't let anything stop you from thinking if you have a twenty twenty one M one iPad Pro twelve point nine inch, don't let anything. St- Stop you from thinking that oh well it's not going to fit quite well. Yeah, you may remember again, it fits perfectly. I bought the Logitech uh, Combo Touch because I thought it wasn't going to fit my new iPad, and I used it for a while. And then I thought I should try. I still have my Magic Keyboard, and it fits so well. And it really is the best because of the floating and all it re- that stuff. It's it really is. The, the only thing I wish it did was I wish you could fold it. But I wish it had a 360 degree hinge so that I could like yes. use it in like handheld tablet mode. But the thing is, because it attaches via magnet, so I can just simply it pop off. it off and yeah. do it. So that's fine. But then you and have this husk of a keyboard lying around, and it's kind of annoying. yeah. But you know, yeah. husk, husks are part of life. <laughs> uh, the the uh, but yeah, it's. It, and and it really it really does. I've used the Magic Keyboard before, obviously not as an owner, but I do fully appreciate after having it for a week. This is why it costs three hundred fifty dollars. I don't think it's overpriced at all. It is such a beautiful, perfectly made. The keyboard is super comfortable. It doesn't feel at all like a mobile keyboard. It's just three hundred fifty dollars for me was going to be way too much. I could justify spending for a keyboard case. Uh, so that's just an update. So once again, if you thought if you thought that a it's not going to fit or b you you thought you missed your shot last week, still available, it's only available in black because that's what was available in. Uh, but you got that. Uh, but the other thing that's kind of cool is that uh, one of the uh, real, one of the great features of Monterey coming up that I'm really looking forward to. We've talked about a little bit is, is uh, object capture, which is an API based system uh, for taking photos of a 3D object and turning it into a digital 3D object, and it's being handled by the operating system. Obviously, as soon as Monterey ships, we're going to see a million of these apps. Some of them are going to be good. Some of these are going to be bad. However, someone has actually created one uh, that will work with a beta, and it's available in the app store. It's called PhotoCatch. You can go to photocatch.app to find the uh, download link for it. Works with your iPhone, works with any other pictures, and it's not terribly sophisticated maybe it's maybe these apps are not going to be sophisticated because they don't have to be but they seem to work very very well i uh, i don't have i don't have monterey running on anything yet because i uh i don't trust it on my on my real max yet but i've seen so many people using this and i've seen the models they've created with it and oh my god i can't wait to get my to, it, it almost made me upgrade to monterey immediately just so i could start playing with this so this seems it's, like it's going to be a fun thing to do I thought Alex Lindsay got one of his picks mixed up with yours at first. <laughs> I, didn't, I haven't nope. seen it coming. I knew that it was coming. I, I, I mean, I, not, not this app, but I knew that we'd eventually start to see some Quite test apps that came yeah. out. Because yeah. what's so exciting is that 
what I, and we talked about this before, that Apple didn't take the step of creating the app for you. It, cre it made it hard enough that someone else can build something and get some exposure and, and everything else. And people are going to be able to build apps and make money with them. And, right. um, but they built all the hard, they did all the hard work, like getting all the photogrammetry to, to figure its way out um, is the stuff that's really, really difficult. And Apple has really done a good job. And it, this is going to get more complicated because eventually what you want is an iPhone. Right now, it's just like, just take a bunch of photos and throw them in. Whereas eventually the iPhone app uh, or people will build apps that guide you through this yeah, the process. Like, right. yes, I have all the data. Yeah. They'll start processing it in real time. They'll start doing a bunch of other things. Like it's, it's, this is baby steps in very, very basic, but I would, to Andy's point, if you have Monterey or if you're willing to put it on a computer, uh, I'm literally, after, literally in the last 10 minutes, I was like, I'm buying an M1 <laughs> Mac just to do this. I mean, I'm literally gonna buy an M1. Just to run Monterey. <laughs> Just to run Monterey, yeah. just to run this app, you know, like like Yay. I was just because I, you know, because I, I and, finally and, I made Alex buy something that was oh, really yeah, expensive. Yeah, you're very expensive. <laughs> well, exactly. and it, it's interesting, and I don't know oh. if this is if this is a lower quality, but you can actually do it from a video. So they show actually yeah. on the webpage how you, you can, can just <coughs> shoot a video and then send it to. Uh, yep. Your Mac. You'll get higher yeah. quality with more resolution. With more, all yep. those things are going to give you. If you have more resolution, uh, what's available? I don't know if they're using it. Is the LiDAR data helps. Right. Um, being able to control the phone and how it shoots is going to help. So there are things that will make it better, but it, you can definitely do lots of things. Um, yeah. But the other thing that's exciting is is that what I'm doing with it is I, I'm building a new shelf. I'm going to replace this gray background with a shelf, but I want it to be like these classic media devices that I have laying around. And so I'm planning to digitize them all, take pictures of them all, turn them all into something so I can visualize my shelf before I, before <laughs> I start cutting wood. And so the whole idea of the whole shelf will look a certain way. I'll even key myself in front of it, but, but the, to make sure like this is- exactly Why even right bother? Way. Why not just have a completely digital shelf? Because because that's, I want to do multi camera. Yeah. Well, because I want to do multi camera with oh, close ups easier, and moving cameras and everything around. else. Yeah, yeah. And it becomes like a you don't want to have to buy a special head for your cameras and <laughs> yep. motion graphics yeah. capture video cards. And it will look. And, I think it will look nice too. I, I think that this is uh, this is good because I I don't have anything else to put behind me. But once a, you a can pre nice. a shelf is what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Using but, 3D uh, capture. And remember that all of this. Uh, these models can all be imported into Motion. So Apple's Motion, their yep. $50 app. You can just drop these models in. You can, from Motion, you can also take those into Final Cut. So you can literally take pictures of these objects, have them export them as USDZ, and have them in your Final Cut edit. You know, like that's doable today. Yeah, this yeah. Is, these are wild. This is amazing. Yeah, it's it's um, again. I'm so close to it. It's, uh, it might be even the next beta. I'll wait for one more stable release to come out. Let's get one more st stable-ish beta that looks good to come out. But uh, but to to, to Alex's, Alex's point, I am so glad that this is an API that's built into macOS and not just simply here is a way that we're going to sell more iPhones because uh, right. I, as because Lid lidar is a nice enhancement for this process, but it's going to be the real win about this is going to be able to, to acquire your your uh, your images however you want wherever you want with whatever tool you want uh, including your really wonderful brand new uh micro four thirds camera that you're still obsessed with even though you've had it right. for two or three weeks now uh, and then just simply <laughs> drag it to, i'm still oh my who god who is this i would imagine somebody named andy and Nako, maybe like. oh god it's yeah. like I, it's i have i will only say that i've i've got the 600 millimeter did you get like, the really olympus nice what did you get I got the uh, I got the Mark III, the recently updated. Yeah. Excuse me, last year's update. They had a, a you were you were in Hawaii when I made this my pick of the week. I actually, op un it actually arrived during the show, so I had to leap from my chair. Yeah. And I will without I won't take up another uh, another ten minutes talking about it because I could take up another hour talking about it. But yeah, it's uh, it is you know that you made the right decision if I if I. I after this show, I'm going to go next door and pick up my usual Tuesday night Italian sub, uh, and I'm going to be taking my I want 3D my, pictures my of your my Italian camera sub. and my 600 and my 600 <laughs> big 600 millimeter lens. I'm going to go for a walk around just in case there's something cool to take pictures of because I cannot stop taking pictures oh, of this camera. It is so cool. I, want, I haven't even started using it. Yet. I want a 3D capture of the sub. That's what I want. How many how many images yes. does it take to uh, to do a good job with this, uh, Alex? How many? So 70, as, many as, as many as you can. I mean, no, I'm seeing can, some of these could, people do 240 and... Yeah, there's some there's some objects that you could probably capture in 
10 or 15 questions. Uh, you know, it doesn't, you can definitely get it with a handful of Just of, depends um, what detail just you that, want, I guess. Well, th th there's a couple things that you're looking for. Number one is the level of detail that you want, how much yeah. little, of the little areas that you want. And the big thing is occlusion. So what is, when you're shooting from certain angles, you have to get every angle. Uh, you know, if it, if it can't right. see it, it can't model it. So, right. so you have to like, for instance, for some objects, what you really want is a turntable that's really, they have, yeah. you're, these are large. What you want is something really small because you want your camera to get down below it and then be able to go around it from the bottom so that it, you can get all the all the geometry right. from from below and so and this is also where the lidar information becomes super useful because when you're looking up you might be seeing the ceiling but the lidar can tell the app theoretically if it depending if the app's looking for it but this is in the API oh don't don't pay attention to that stuff out there because right. I know that that's further away and so that's going to make it you know it can do some pretty Slick things. Yeah, it's, it's exciting. Let's hear, uh, so that, by the way, was photo catch for object capture. You do have to have a Monterey beta, and it's free, I think, right, Andy? I think so. Yeah. It keeps, and he keeps producing new betas. Yep. Yeah. And he keeps making new versions for different betas. Even if you have the first beta, he has a legacy version of it uh, still up. So, great cool. stuff. Photocatch.app. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Alex Lindsay's pick of the week. So we had uh, these folks on yesterday uh. on, on, on office hours, um, and it's a it's a it is a um, program called Hedge, uh, and they have actually been around for quite some time. And um, so what they do is, if you are a uh, if you're a video, one of the big problems you get into is your on site, and we. Um, Paul was on yesterday and, and he was talking about the, how it got made was basically with Apple script at first. It's now all written, wow. of course, in Swift or whatever. But, but the, but the, it started 10 years ago. They had a show where they had 15 cameras and 12 hours of, of content for a reality show. And they had to deliver all of this footage the, you know, by the next day to an Avid editor who had to cut it together and had to have all the time code and had all be lined, synced and lined up. And so they started working on it. It was a lot of work and they started building all these Apple scripts. And before they knew it, they had a, they had something that they figured, well, maybe we should turn this into an app. And so they turn it into an app. Um, and what it does, and it's been around for a while, but what it does is you can take your memory card, like you're shooting and you're doing your memory card or your drive or whatever, and you can copy it to multiple locations at one time or to multiple, you can have multiple cards going to multiple locations or you can have multiple cards going to one location. But the point is, is that for ingest, for reliable ingest that's managed um, through the system, what it does is it seamlessly allows you to, on Mac or Windows, uh, but it, it allows you to ingest all of that footage. And for a lot of us that are on site, ingesting is the scariest thing you do because you shoot all this footage and now this is the show. This is what you spent all that money on, you know, to do. And now you got to reliably get it to backup and you might want to send it to primary. You might want to send it, you might like, be, for instance, you might have your primary, your backup and the client output. And you could, this will do all of those things. And instead of doing it one at a time, it might be a little slower, but it's like, you, I can throw all this stuff at it, come back in the morning and all the stuff's been archived where it needs to go and then it, it keeps track of it all. So, um, so that's what, you know, that's what Hedge does in its, um, in, in what it's doing. This is a little bit of a, you know, production <laughs> um, uh, vertical, but they just took, out, took on some investment. So they've also bought uh, Divergent Media, which makes Edit Ready and Scopebox. Um, and so they're really building around this pipeline of, of us as uh, video um, production folks. And it's not just Final Cut, but it definitely works with Final Cut. Um, and But how do we manage all of that content? How do we pull it all off when we're on site? How do we manage it once we have it? Um, you know, how we prep it for transcode, those types of things. And so um, a little heady, uh, but for anybody who's listening who's done a lot of shooting and has a lot of footage from the field, um, it's worth checking out. Hedge. It's cool. Hedge, Hedge multiple backups of your media, fast and easy. I, we asked them what, we're like, so what's the name Hedge? This is, again, he's, if you want to hedge your bets, you can watch an hour of it. Yeah. No, no, it's not. That's what we thought it was. He yeah. said, in, in, it's, uh, in Denmark, they said, when you throw something over the hedge, it's like, not my problem. Oh, and, you know, like, it's like, I'm going to throw funny. it over the hedge to somebody else. <laughs> oh, how It's not funny. my problem. And said, instead of throwing it to a, usually that means I'm going to throw it to a person and, and they're going to have to deal with it. In this case, he said, we want the computer to do that. Like, it's not your problem. The computer will, Love you know, it. do all the things you need to, to make that work. So, and if, yeah. It's, it's That's cool. a good name. No, I yeah. like it. Thank you, Alex. And now Renee Ritchie with his pick of the week. 
you know, just quickly to Alex's point, I record on dual SF Express, CF Express cards just right. for redundancy, but then I plug them into my Mac and sometimes it doesn't recognize the adapter and I got to unplug it, plug it back in again. Sometimes there's transfer. I use it for ridiculous transfer speeds, but sometimes it goes slower than USB one. So I've got to reboot Leo's Apple TV to get it to go back to the normal speeds. And it's, <laughs> it's, this kind of stuff is just like, you, and you have your entire show on that thing. So you really are yeah. all stressed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my pick of the week is, is, what, one of the things I love about the time that we're living in is that a lot of this production equipment keeps getting less and less expensive and more and more available. And every company is really, like we talked a few weeks ago about uh, Aperture making much more affordable lighting. And Sony has been doing these much more affordable cameras. They did um, a sort of a vlogger camera where you couldn't change the lens, but it had things like showcase mode. And it was yeah, really Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Now they just put out a... Uh, a interchangeable, basically a mirrorless camera with interchangeable lenses, but it's seven hundred dollars rather than a thousand dollars. You can put it's APC lenses, but you can put you know any lens you want. It's compatible with all the vlogging stuff they made for the previous camera, so it's got like that Bluetooth stick that you can hold onto it. It's got all the different uh, Sony audio heads that you can put on it. It's like the different microphones that you can put on it, uh, and of course you know like Justine and Jenna and everybody uh, iPhone Doe, they all had their their tests on it full <laughs> first day that it was available. But for somebody who's just getting into this and they need more than just a static camera, like whether they're streaming or they're doing video work and whether that video work is reaction videos or like tech videos, it just, it takes a lot of the complex, it's not as flexible as if you get a cine camera, like if you get a Canon, uh, you know, or, or you get a, a Sony uh, cine camera, of course, but it does so much, for so, so, and it's still, it's still a lot of money to some people, but it's so much less money than any of the traditional cameras. And I, it just feels like we're opening up this whole thing to even even more people. Like the hardware is becoming as accessible as YouTube and, and TikTok and Instagram and all the platforms have been for a while. Yeah, this is really the trend. 700 bucks. Uh, it's so tempting to buy this, except I'm not a, a vlogger, so I really have yeah. no excuse. But I really... But if you were... <laughs> if I were, I would buy it. The ZV-E10. Yeah, it's a Sony the names Alpha. are so weird. Yeah. I'm sure I'm Sony uses the password manager does, to come up with product yeah, names. Yeah, really. It does USB out, right? It does a USB video out. And it'll show up as a clean, HD, yeah, clean I, I video out. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can get clean out. Um, you, you can capture card it as well, but it, it does. A lot of the cameras do USB out. It's not yes, quite it says quality. easy it's live quality. streaming with single USB cable and no extra yeah. hardware or software. So it is also a, a streaming cam. So you can use it can... for your Zoom calls as well. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how long it can run with that, uh, on 4K without overheating. I, was, like, I didn't. I didn't know that was still a thing, but I was. Uh, I saw the latest uh, Bernadette Banner video yesterday, and she said, "Okay, I'm back. I have to, my camera overheated again, so I have to start. So oh, I had geez. to take a break. I believe it has no 29 it in, minute. Limitless. It does not have a continuous recording yeah. limit for movie shooting, so okay. they really are treating it like. But, but that doesn't mean it doesn't overheat. But I have to think it might mean that they. Sony's feel like, have been really good. Canon's yeah. like the R5. I have an R5, and it will overheat. Like if I'm doing 8K, like I, it will just absolutely overheat. But the uh, the Sony's have been really good with that. Yeah. 8K, you can understand. 4K, you're, you'd hope that at this point, you'd, you're not stuck to like a five-minute runtime. Uh, like the R, R100, I think, was uh, for like a couple of different editions of that. It was like, yeah, we're going to shut this down before it explodes in your hand. Yeah. So Canon does this thing where no no one camera is allowed to have every feature that makes sense for that camera it, because <laughs> then you would just need one camera. So like, like one of them has mini HDMI and one has full HDMI. One of them has a full sensor. One has a crop sensor. One, and so my the R5 will overheat on 8K, but also if you do the full quality 4K and they had the artificial limit, but then they removed it. Like it's just, it's, it's so frustrating, but it just, the color is just so good. This is very tempting for me because of course I'm, I'm, I'm a Sony shooter. So I have a lot of Sony lenses. Yeah. I have the digital shotgun mic. I have a lot of the equipment, but does it support, is it a separate lens mount? I wish I could figure that out. I bet you, it must support my. I think it's just Sony APC alpha, lenses. My alpha, yeah. yeah, maybe it's only APC because yeah, I have all full frame lenses. Yeah. Oh well. I just went all in on RF lenses, and they're. That's amazing. the problem. But yeah, you're really out. stuck when you when you start buying lenses. That's so much more expensive than the camera. Yeah. Well, for video, you need them to be quiet too. Like it's really hard if yeah. you're doing video and you hear the lens going eh, 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 as it tries to focus. So, yeah. and the new ones are so much faster and so much quieter and so much steadier. They all have built-in. They have uh, stabilization in the body and in the lens, and it's just it gets compelling at a certain point. Nice. And it does have it does have a micro HDMI as well. So you could do you could theoretically yeah. co out of it as well as like a little as a 
really nice webcam for your uh, ATEM Mini. Yeah. 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 Well, all right. I'm trying really hard not to buy it, but uh, <laughs> it's pretty cool. What do you shoot with Nelly? What's Sony camera? Uh, the A7R4. R4. So, it, yeah. but that's a full frame. I mean, I wouldn't mind if it cropped the full frame. That's not an issue. So you could just get an A7S3 Leo. That would be the only camera. Actually, that'd probably really be the way to do it, right? Yeah. 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 And I could shoot in uh, in vlog and. You could shoot. You could shoot God if you came across jealous. something in the desert. Yes. Like you, you could do anything with that camera. <laughs> You look at what Philip Bloom does with that thing. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's a really amazing camera. I'm kind of, again, holding off. Renee yeah. Ritchie's doing his best to get me to spend money. So is Alex Lindsay. So is uh, so is Andy Anako. That's their job. All I know is I got Alex. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's, 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 it's like, it's like a, a hard first person shooter where it's like I will never. Uh, it's a hard one to get. Yeah. Now yeah. you're spawn sniping him for the rest of the year. Yeah. Uh, Andy Anako, when are you going to be on GBH next? I'm going to be on uh, 1 p.m. on Thursday. Go to WGBHnews.org and stream it either live or later. I know I said last week that I was going to be in the Boston Public Library back in the studio. Turns yeah. out that's been post put Shock. off again. So, yeah, but so We're looking forward to it. But, as well in the uh, studio. Yeah, but, but like I said, you can stream it live or you can uh, stream it later. Just search my name and you'll, it'll come up in the right show. Thank you, Andrew. Thank Alex you Lindsay, 090.media is your day job. And then your 24 hours a day job is <laughs> office hours dot global. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a group project. Yeah. Use we the focus uh, on hedge. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, it's, uh, yeah, we had a release from sound devices there and we've got a lot of, uh, anyway, it's, it, we're having a lot of fun. The, the two hours is great. Um, you know, we're, we're covering a lot of ground. It's just an incredible group of panelists that, that are really in the second hours are obviously getting really good. The, um, the, the 23 hour ver outside of it has gotten kind of interesting, uh -oh. you know, in the sense yeah. that we, you know, that there are 23 hours of what we call after hours. So there's office hours and there's after hours <laughs> and the after hours. And it is, the after hours is just as interesting. You, you go on, there's 50, there's typically about 50 people floating around on between 30 and 50 people 24 seven. Um, and so we got on this morning, I got on this morning, the guys were like talking about modular synths. So I started asking some questions and we started breaking like how modular synths work and how the oscillator works and how the, uh, how it's connected to the LFO and how we, you know, like there's like this long drawn out and we decided, well, we're gonna have to make this a second hour or, or something. But we spent like an hour talking about it randomly and, and they realized, I, they said, oh, we, we had done something at four o'clock, like at four o'clock in the morning before I got up, they had already done a whole thing <laughs> about modular synth, you know, and, and so it's becoming like, you know, the, and, but it, but what's interesting is, is that in the evening, what's happening is the guys were talking about it's like an open, again, it's like the open office that you always wanted, which is the open office where you can still shut the doors, right? That you have a bunch of people that are really smart that do this all over the world and they're all there. Like you can say, hey, I don't understand how this works. And someone will just go, oh, this is how, don't, don't do that. And then they go back, you go back to what you're doing. So it is all the advantages of open office, except uh, if you don't want to talk to anyone, you just turn it off. Officehours.global. It's not a show. It's a lifestyle, apparently. It is. Yes, it is. It is. It's becoming honey, a lifestyle. Honey, you're, Alex, honey, you're not spending enough time with the family. You know what? Tell you what. I'll cut down to just one show a day for you. <laughs> it, was, it was actually my biggest upset. Yesterday, we lost power in Nevada because, oh, you know, it's no. California. It's oh, California. No. You get used to it. And and the uh, all, the, all the generators, except for me, because I haven't got my generator yet, all the generators turned on. Everyone's gotten used to it now. And, um, and the... Uh, uh, the funny thing was my, my biggest problem was I was like, oh, I'm not going to be in after hours. I, I was I was planning to sit, <laughs> sit there in the evening and hang out. My wife was out hi hiking. And so I was like, I, I can, I can, I can just station to get your power converters. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Renee Ritchie, you can find him on YouTube, youtube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Anything uh, you want to plug? Uh, yesterday, I put up my my version, my hot take on the whole Tim Cook, Elon Musk brouhaha. And I'm, oh, I love it. <laughs> today, I'm going to talk about the timeline for Apple Silicon Max and how long it's actually going to oh, get on it. Oh, I will have to All watch the that. Stuff. Yes. The place to be. Thoughtful Apple reviews and analysis. And he's and he's really kind of toning down the reaction snap uh, shots in the thumbnail, I have to say. Just a little smile here, a little eyebrow raise there. Oh, if you go to the videos tab, though, you can see I've got some good Tim Cook and Elon Musk face going on. Oh, there you go. They got the reaction. Yeah, let them do the work. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, YouTube.com slash Renee Ritchie. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Andy. Great to have you all. Thanks. 
to all of you for joining us each week. We do Mac Break Weekly on a Tuesday around 11 a.m. Pacific. That's 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. If you want to watch us do it live, you can. Just go to twit.tv slash live. There's audio and video streams there of the, you know, making of. Sometimes we get a little nerdy about Star Wars before the show begins. <laughs> no, a little. That would never. That I'm a, a that little. Would, I'm offended. <laughs> that was a good chat. <laughs> uh, so if you tune in, uh, make sure you join us live because that's, uh, that's where you're going to get all that stuff. Uh, you can also, if you're watching live, chat with us live at irc.twit.tv. TV. After the show is done and we get the editors working on it, cleaning it up, uh, the final version comes out on the website, twit.tv slash mbw. It also is posted to YouTube. There's a whole YouTube channel devoted to Mac Break Weekly. Uh, and, of course, if you have a podcast client, who doesn't these days? You can subscribe in that. Just search for Mac Break Weekly. Do us a favor, though, if your podcast client allows reviews, leave us a five-star review. Let the world know. You listen to Mac Break Weekly. Let them share the share the wealth with others. Uh, there's another way to play, and that's our club twit. I want to encourage everybody who wants to support this show and keep it on the air and all of our shows to join Club Twit. Seven dollars a month. Uh, it's month to month. You can cancel at any time. What do you get? You get ad-free versions of all of our shows. Ad-free plus tracker free. You also get. Uh, access to the Club Twit Discord, which is a, really a lot of fun. Some great people, more than 3,000 of them now in there, and, and a lot of fun. And you get the Twit Plus feed, which includes stuff that uh, doesn't make it into the podcast, including, I don't know, Star Wars nerdery, maybe, perhaps a little bit. <laughs> Things like that, uh, our Untitled Linux show, uh, the Giz Fizz. So uh, I think it's a pretty good deal for 7 bucks. but most importantly, you get the satisfying feeling of knowing uh, you're keeping us going. We really, really appreciate that. Find out more at twit.tv slash club twit. That's it for Mac Break Weekly. Another Mac Break Weekly is uh, done, which means... It's time for you to go back to work because break time is over. See you next week. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you are interested in checking out all things smart home and Internet of Things, then you should check out Smart Tech Today, the podcast I, Micah Sargent, do with my co-host Matthew Casanelli. It's all about the smart home and improving your automations.